Excellent. Um, so the other thing that you will see uh, every morning when you log on is our schedule over here, like you see on the left. As you can see, we are going to be very busy over the first couple of weeks, and then things are really going to get busy after that. Uh, so we have the content that we'll be talking about for lecture and lab. Uh, we're going to do the introduction, jump through all the hoops, make sure you guys are prepared to be successful in this format. Uh, uh, when, and then we're going to dive into lecture today. So we are going to start talking about our introduction and our anatomical terminology. Uh, labs, we will start a discussion of the organ systems. And then uh, we are, I'm going to encourage you to start working with your uh, lab manuals, starting looking at unit one and the review of that and start looking at the materials in there. Uh, most of you, well, okay. Most maybe isn't the right word. A fair number of you uh, spent the past week logging on. The Canvas site has been open for the past week, and unfortunately, not everybody has uh, taken a chance to take an opportunity to take advantage of that. Uh, but there are a lot of activities, again, to get you up to speed to this format. One of the frustrating things about doing this online is that anatomy and physiology is a hard class. That's why I like teaching it. I don't have to be tricky. I don't have to be complicated because anatomy and physiology is hard. And so one of the nice things about teaching a very straightforward class is that, is that the process doesn't usually have to get in the way. Here online, the process gets in the way. So there are a bunch of hoops you need to jump through to help you to accommodate and get ready for this format so we can focus on just learning the material. Uh, there is a, and again, this is dumbfounding to me, quite frankly, uh, but there is a lab safety form you have to fill out because I guess if I ask you to flex your elbow in class and you bump it against something, the school doesn't want to be sued. So if you want to participate in this class, because technically it is a lab class, you do have to fill out that lab safety form uh, that is on there. A quick note on that, and I think it says it on it as well. Uh, your information goes at the top, your signature goes at the bottom. Uh, three quarters of the way down the page uh, is a place for your emergency contact person. So I guess if you spontaneously combust and I see it occurring on your Zoom camera, I know who to call to let them know about that. So again, it is something that is required for this class. We will fill that out. Uh, chemistry is a prerequisite for this class. Uh, so uh, there is a chemistry quiz. That chemistry quiz is worth 20 points. Uh, I will warn you right now, these chemistry questions are not my questions. This is not how I ask. Um, uh, that's not how I ask questions. I went to one of our chemistry instructors on campus and I said, give me 20 questions that you think that a student who successfully completes your class should be able to answer. And uh, she provided that for me. So this is a way to encourage you to remember the chemistry. So I don't have to remind you what a covalent bond is. I don't have to remind you what an acid or a base is or a pH or any of those types of things. Uh, if, uh, like any good student should have done, you burnt all your chemistry materials after you completed your chemistry class, what I would recommend is in your textbook, read everything up to, in chapter two, which is the chemistry, read everything up to macromolecules. Macromolecules are the important stuff. That is the stuff that we are going to uh, be focusing on. And so everything basically before that is stuff you should have known coming into this. This chemistry quiz and really every assignment that is due in this class is due at the beginning of class. So it is due at when I start at eight o'clock. At eight o'clock when I start teaching is when these things are due. So make sure you do it. You can do it as early as today uh, or tomorrow, uh, but make sure it is done by Wednesday morning. Uh, one of the issues that I had over the summer, I did have the honor and privilege of teaching 430 over the summer. And one of the things that students got into the habit of doing is they would complete the assignment the night before, but they would wait till they logged on to Canvas at 7.55 before our eight o'clock class to then drop it into the Dropbox. And if they ran into technical problems and it took them more than the five minutes they gave themselves, it was late. The good news is you can turn assignments in late up to one week late, but if it is five days late or five minutes late, it is still half credit. So I encourage you as soon as you get it done, make sure you are depositing it into the Dropbox so that you don't have to worry about that last minute drop. All right, also on Wednesday, again, that proctorio protocol and syllabus quiz is due. Yes, I did misspell syllabus apparently. Um, 
and I'm a horrible typist. I'm a horrible speller, but I'm also a horrible typist. I can't, uh, I have to look at my fingers while I'm typing. And uh, so I make plenty of mistakes, both because I don't know how to spell, but also because I don't know how to type. So uh, I feel good about that. The nice thing is if we're in the classroom, I'd be writing this on the board and you would see that I also have horrible penmanship as well. Like truly the trifecta. Uh, but the point of this Proctorio uh, protocol quiz is to make sure that you have the Proctorio uh, camera and microphone and all of that set up properly for a real exam. Uh, when you take the lecture exams, when you take the lab exams, when you take the final exams, you are going to be recorded on camera using the Proctorio protocols. And so this is a way, safe way to ensure that you have that set up properly. So hopefully on the day of the actual quiz, we're not going to have that many issues. Lastly, and not nearly enough of you have taken advantage of this over the past week, uh, you have an opportunity because we're going to be doing this online. I want to encourage students to uh, come get to know me, me to get to know you. Uh, so if you come to my office hours for five minutes, you will get five points of extra credit. Uh, you've all lost all of the ample opportunity to do that last week, but we have office hours after class today. Uh, I will make some additional times available for you to be able to do that, but your opportunity to get those five points of extra credit ends Wednesday morning at eight o'clock when we start class. As you continue down the schedule, you see there are a lot of different assignments. Again, there's a lot of assignments in your lab manual. One of the things I love about your lab manual is that it is like a workbook. And at the end of each section, uh, they have these unit reviews where basically there's two types of questions that they ask. They have a check your recall, which is where you're basically just regurgitating information. And they have a check your understanding, which is where you have to do some critical thinking to try to come up with some of the answers. I love those critical thinking questions that make you fire a synapse or two. In fact, uh, those types of questions often can end up in a test bank uh, for an actual exam as well. So those are things that I expect you to do. It is basically directed studying. I'm looking for you to put time and effort into them. You should be able to get them correct. You have your lab manual, you have your textbook, you have the almighty Google, all of those things are readily available to you. So you should easily be able to get those things correct. However, I'm looking for the time and effort. And because I want this to be a learning process, I will not penalize you for getting things incorrect. I will not mark you off if you get an answer wrong. However, if you leave an answer blank or don't fill in an answer or just if it asks, is it A and B and explain <clears throat> your answer and you just put A, that doesn't show me time, that doesn't show me effort and for that you will lose points for. It. So most of the assignments in this class, you will get graded on based on uh, participation, effort and time for completeness. There are going to be some assignments that are due by correctness. Some of those involve, for instance, uh, your labster activities. Let's make a, a pretty arrow here. Because we are in the online format, we are going to try to use as many ways as possible to help you guys to be able to get some type of uh, learning activity experience from this. All right, uh, lab type of activities. Uh, one of the ways we are gonna do this, or many of the ways that you do this is gonna use lab simulators. The Labsters is a big one. Well, we'll go over the website and I'll show you some of those things later. Uh, labsters uh, are activities, virtual activities that you're doing, lab simulators, where you have to do 100% of the activities, but you also have to get it 80% correct. If you get less than 80% correct, the good news is you can go back and complete it a second time and improve your grade. If you don't, you will not get full credit for it. So that 80% is the, is, the, is the critical point. If you do 80% or better, you will get full credit for it. If you do less than 80%, then you will get a prorated score. Uh, the other major lab simulator we're gonna be doing is gonna be PhysioX. Uh, the nice thing about Labster is it is uh, synced with our Canvas. So as you complete the activities, it will report it. The problem with the PhysioX is that it doesn't. It is a standalone program. And so when you are done with that, you are going to be getting a lab report and you are gonna submit those lab reports. Uh, PhysioX exercise one, which is due Wednesday the 9th, has five different activities. And so you're gonna get five different lab reports and those will all be submitted online. And again, I will show you how to submit all these things if you haven't done it before. 
Also, if you notice, as you work the way down the list, also on Wednesday the 9th, we have our practice lab exam because that is five days before your first exam. This will be a chance for you to see what a timed lab exam in the um, Canvas format is going to be like so that it'll prepare you for the real quiz. So we'll see how you're studying and how you're preparing up to that period of time. So like I said, when you log in, you'll always have the game plan there uh, showing you what's going to be going on over the next few days, next few weeks to give you some idea of what we are doing. All right. Questions on any of this before I race the board? Uh, great question. So uh, the uh, question is about the labster. How many retakes can you do to get above 80%? As many as you want. You can complete that activity as many times as you want. So if it takes you 45 times to do it, which hopefully it shouldn't, um, then you have that opportunity. So yes, so you, you can do it as many times as you want. Again, these are, same thing with the Physio X for that matter as well. These are directed studying. These are learning activities. And so the point of a learning activity is that you can complete it as many times as you want. Tests, tests you only get to do once. All right, like I said, one last thing. If you have not taken that daily quiz, please go and do that now. If you do not do it now, you will be dropped from the class. Uh, make sure you complete that. Again, it's just one question you're answering if you're enrolled or wait list. The access code is FLIP. Make sure you do that, uh, otherwise you will get dropped. Um, professor? Yes. You said that um, you're not gonna give study guide, but is it gonna be like straightforward? Like, I didn't for say every I chapter? Study. So um, yes, and so that's a great question. And so let's talk about that. First of all, uh, you will get study guides uh, for certain aspects of the class, absolutely, especially the lab. When we get to the lab stuff, many of the lab things we're <coughs> doing, um, you will have a, a uh, study guide for. Uh, for that to so give you precisely the information and the vocabulary that's going to be associated with that as well. Okay. For the lecture parts, the, the outline slides, which I make available, so again, all the lecture slides are available on Canvas. Um, they are your outline. They're not mm -hmm. an alternative to coming to class. They really are truly your outline of what we're going to be talking about. They're the breadcrumbs that are going to lead us on the path of the things that we are going to talk about. Okay. Um, if you think about it, and again, a lot of this has to do with teaching philosophy. My teaching philosophy is that my job in this class is to be your tour guide, right? Again, the weekend's coming up. All right, no, it's Monday. It's not really coming up. But if this weekend, when it comes up, uh, let's say you decide to go to Paris for the weekend, right? If you go to Paris for the weekend, do you just start in the upper left north corner of Paris and go street by street all the way through Paris down to the bottom lower left south corner of it? and that's how you spend your weekend? No, it's not an efficient way to spend your time in Paris. Instead, you get a tour guide who, instead of taking you and canvassing the entire uh, city of Paris, takes you to the highlights. Mm -hmm. That's my job. If you look in chapter one, chapter one may have 20 concepts in it. In class, in lab, uh, in lecture, on the assignments and homeworks you're gonna be doing, you may only do 12 of those things. Those are the things that I think are most important. And the things that I think are most important are the things that are gonna be on the exam. Okay. If there is a concept in your textbook that we do not talk about in lecture, that we do not have a lab on, that you do not have a homework assignment that involves, then it's not gonna be on the test. Hmm. All right, so okay. um, the lecture is the outline. The problem with study guides, I've done study guides many times in the past, and the problem with a study guide is if you don't, as a teacher, if I give a student a study guide, all they do is study the study guide. And so that means that if I don't put a piece of information on the study guide and I put it on the test, everybody gets pissed off because like, hey, that wasn't on the study guide. And so the, basically what my study guide becomes is me rewriting the entire lecture. That's not conducive. Mm -hmm. You are responsible for every single thing we talk about in this class. Every single thing we do on lab, every single thing we do on lecture, every single thing we, we do on homework, you are responsible for. Now, when, for instance, we get to the bones, when we get to the bones in the second section, you know, right, you've got how many, how many name bones do we have again? Anyone? 206. 206, there you go. Every single one of those bones probably has 10 <coughs> or more different bone features on them. Are you gonna be responsible for every single bone feature on every single bone in the human body? 
Mm. No. It's yes. going to feel like it. It's going to feel like it, but the answer is going to be no. So what's going to happen is there I will give you a precise list. On the femur, there may be 10 things you need to know, right? On a rib, there may just be two. In fact, there may be some bones where you don't need to know any bone features about them. In that case, I will give you a precise list of the specific pieces of information that you are going to be responsible for. All right? Okay. Great question. Did that answer it? Yeah. Thank okay. you. Excellent. 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 Any other questions? Yes. Is this the correct book that you're talking about? Uh, I, who is talking? Hold on, let me. Alfreda. Keep, keep the holding. lab book. Alfreda. Looking through all the pictures here, trying to find who's got their book. I'm Hold just your book up. Is this the correct lab book? No. Great question. No. Uh, the um, Yours is going to be slightly different from mine. But this here, let's actually go ahead and do that. That right there is the correct lab manual. It is the uh, Exploring Anatomy and Physiology, third edition with a little bit of the brain showing here. Now, this is the instructor edition. Mine is uh, bound. Uh, which, quite frankly, I hate. The nice thing about the student version is your guys' is loose leaf. So you can just have just the pages that you are working on and make that work for you. Um, the other option is, again, if you don't want to have a physical copy of it, you do have the option of renting it from places like Chegg or places like Vital Source. Uh, what I will tell you is that Chegg does allow, uh, I've had many students rent from Chegg before and they've never had a printing issue uh, with like limitation on how many changes. I don't know vital sources printing procedures. Uh, again, there's going to be a lot of pages. Either you're going to be saving as PDFs or printing out and filling out as homework, taking pictures of and turning them in. Uh, the only other thing that I would remind you, actually two things, uh, the other thing that I would remind you is that um, while you may save money this semester by renting it from Chegg, if you're here in 430 and you're moving on to 431, you're going to need it for two semesters. So if the bundle is 110 and you can rent it from Chegg for 60, that sounds great until you remember you have to rent it again next semester from Chegg for 60 more dollars. And now you're paying 120 to rent a book and you're not getting no problem. one. Oh, see, that would have been so dramatic if I'd been able to pull that out accurately. Where the heck is it? Um, I don't know where it is. I'm listening. Uh, your histology atlas. One of the things we're going to be doing is we are going to be um, doing a tremendous amount of microscope work, which is going to be hard because you don't have microscopes at home, right? Or most of you, maybe one or two of you do. Most of us don't have microscopes at home. So having a really good histology atlas that helps you to see the slides and really understands it and does a good job to describe it is something that is going to be really, really useful. Uh, ISBN off a of folate when you check. The problem, uh, Haley, that's fine to do that. What I would be concerned about, it, and again, I'm not sure how folate does it, but there are ISBNs for the lab manual. There are ISBNs for the histology atlas but there's also an ISBN for the bundle, for the two of them bundled together. So make sure whatever ISBN you got from that uh, is for the text, I mean, for the lab manual and not necessarily for the bundle. I know there were some problems earlier this week. Those should have been hammered out, so they should have all of the correct bundles now on Follett uh, with all of the correct information or the correct books and materials and resources. Okay, excellent. So that's the that's one for the lab manual. Perfect, thank you. All right. Any other questions? Yes, the loose, the loose lid, the loose leaf. Is it this one? No, not the one. No, so that is your photographic atlas. So that's the one that comes with the textbook bundle. Again, uh, I hate that the process of this gets in the way of us learning. But one of the things you're going to be responsible for in this class is learning all the bones of the body and all the bone features. And you're never going to get to hold a bone in your hand during this class. We're not going to get to play with the cadaver. You're not going to get to do a dissection. There's so many things we're going to miss out on. So having good resources, like a great 
photographic atlas that has really good pictures of the bones, has really good pictures of the muscles, is going to be a valuable tool to help you. Yes, your textbook has pictures of the bones. Yes, it has pictures of other things and things along those lines. Uh, but it doesn't, it's not the same as holding in your hand. If you hold your, a bone in your hand for an hour and play with it, you're going to own it at the end of that time. So the more ways you can visualize that, the more successful you'll be learning in this kind of an environment. All right. Awesome. I love questions. I, I love this very much. I am a very strong believer that the only stupid question is the question not asked. You know, one of the things that I encourage you guys in the classroom is that uh, be the one that is bold enough to raise your hand. If you were confused by something, I guarantee you somebody else in the class is confused as well. So please be the one that's brave enough to raise your hand and ask the question. And what I usually say in the classroom is if you're not brave enough to do it, then give a buck to the person next to you and ask them to ask the question for you. But that doesn't quite work in this format. So uh, uh, just be brave. If you have to turn off your camera to be able to ask the question, that's fine. Just uh, again, be brave. Uh, do I still need that? No, you don't, yeah, you don't need the ISBN. Again, you just need the name of it, which is on the syllabus. Uh, this could be one way to find it. The ISBN helps to avoid any confusion. Uh, but uh, it isn't necessary. So like I said, you can go to places like Chegg, you can go to places like Vital Source, or Follett now does have the correct um, bundle information there is available for you. So whatever helps you to, to get that lab manual, that's gonna help you to be successful. And there's even more ways to get the textbook than that, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, professor? Yes. Are we gonna have lab every Monday and Wednesday, or is it just gonna be like one day? No, so we meet twice a week, Monday and Wednesday from 8 to 1235. Uh, we'll take a couple breaks in between and all of that. And during that time, we will basically be combining that information. Uh, now, uh, uh, what, again, it's a little different because we're online, uh, but in the classroom, really, th this is one class. It's not a lab class and a lecture class. They're not two different classes, it's one class. Really, lab and lecture are different modalities for learning information. Right. When we're trying to understand a process like, you know, how a action potential occurs in a neuron, describing those processes are things that do well when I'm writing on the board and we're talking and we're discussing and doing things along those lines. Uh, and that's what lecture is. Lecture is an interactive teaching process. Lab, like I said, if we were learning the bones, it'd be better to, you know, dump a bunch of bones on the table. You guys would all come stand around them in groups and you would work on them and you'd be more hands on. We don't really have that ability. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be some group activities. There are going to be some group activities. I will be putting you in groups, and you'll be responsible for doing things in groups, including some very, very low-key. I know everybody's blood pressure goes up when I say this, but there are going to be some group presentations that you're going to be doing. But again, you're just presenting information. You're not being graded on your presentation skills. If you need to sit and read it while you are doing that, that is fine. I don't care how you present the information as long as you present it. But we are going to try to do that. But how much lab stuff we can do, we're going to be very limited. So it's going to be a lot more me talking. And, uh, and I'll try to make it as interactive as possible. So yeah, when you, when you look at the schedule, I do kind of break it up into lab and lecture. But really, mostly, it's a lot of talking back and forth for the whole four and a half hours. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, I fear that I have the wrong books for the class. Okay, so here's what I would say. Uh, during the second break, because during the first break, I'm gonna be dealing with enrollment issues. Uh, during the second break, show me what you have and we'll go through and we'll talk about it and see what you have and make sure that you have the right thing. Okay. Okay, the two things that you shall hold up for me look correct. You looks like you should have, so, textbook right yes okay mm -hmm. and then the yellow thing you showed me was the a and p applications right yes right so that and then the second thing you showed me was the photographic atlas those are okay. the things that come in the textbook bundle so there is a textbook bundle and all those things are absolutely the correct thing okay the issue is that there are two bundles that you need for this class a lab uh, bundle and a lecture bundle. So it looks like you have the lecture bundle, but you don't have the lab materials. And I know it doesn't 
I, I know having two bundles can sometimes be confusing. The problem is, is it's two different publishers. It's not the same publisher. And since it's different publishers, that's why they don't bundle them together. But what you have is all of the textbook resources that you need. What you still need is the, either the lab manual or the lab manual bundle that you will have uh, that it will have a lot of graded assignments in. Okay. All right. Any other questions on that or anything else? No. All right. So normally I like to, again, highlight some of the, the, uh, the syllabus stuff to make sure you understand what is expected of you. Again, we have the introductory. This is the first part of A&P. If you have trouble sleeping at night, I encourage you to read the student learning outcomes. That will help you fall asleep. We have spent a lot of time talking about the textbook materials that are responsible, and I appreciate that there's some confusion in that. So the other thing that I want to point out to you is, as we were just talking about, there are basically two main components that you need to be successful in this class. The first involves the textbook bundle. Now again, you can buy the bundle uh, like Alfreda, Alfreda did and have all the resources that you need. A textbook, a photographic atlas, uh, the a and applica uh, uh, applications is something that they throw in for free in the bundle so that it isn't an additional charge. I don't actually do any assignments out of it, uh, but I do know some instructors use it. And, and as a study tool, basically what it is, is it's the clinical application for a lot of these concepts. Because I'm going to be throwing so much information at you, we kind of have to focus on the nuts and bolts. So how you would use that in a kind of nursing or medical type of environment isn't something we always have a chance to talk about. But that a and Applications Manual does a really nice job of talking about real life examples of how you use this stuff. So sometimes if you're having trouble understanding a concept, it is a great resource to go to and read. Uh, but I don't give any assignments from it. And again, it didn't cost you anything extra to get it. So, so it's no harm, no foul that way. The other way, and let's go here. The other way that you can access your uh, textbook and get some of the resources you need is through the My Lab and Mastery. You guys can all see my screen? Yes. Now this is my screen. The professor's version of this is slightly different, but when you click on your My Lab and Mastering, you open the My Lab and Mastering, it takes you to a page uh, that looks something like this. And then what you're gonna look for is your study area. When you go to your study area, this is where you're gonna find many of the important resources that are gonna help you to be successful, including an electronic version of the textbook. This electronic version of the textbook is a very powerful ebook. Uh, what I love about it is it is a permanent ebook. So if you put in bookmarks, if you put in notes as you highlight things, uh, then when you do it one day, it's gonna be there the next day. In fact, when you log on to your 431 class, all of those materials are gonna still be there as well. So as you can see, the last time I used this, I was playing with this for uh, my 431 class where we were talking about blood vessels and we were showing some of the pathways associated with that. It's a really, really good uh, book. It's got all of the chapters and all that. However, the thing I love the most about it is the search feature. If for instance, you are trying to understand or having problems with mitosis, you can type in mitosis and it shows you where the figures are, the focus figures, definitions, and all the locations where you can find that it's talked about. Any additional resources, like for instance, a video showing the process of mitosis is all here as well. They do a really nice job of integrating the, multi, excuse me, the multimedia features with this e-text. Now, every single one of you get a free two week trial to this, uh, uh, Mastering A&P with the e-text. So all of you got that. Uh, if you purchased a bundle, you got a code that you will put in that gives you access to all of these things. However, if you want, you can also just purchase access. Purchasing access to this with the e-text I think is like $115. Now, it doesn't give you a, um, it doesn't give you a photographic atlas. 
So that is something you might want to consider, especially because we're going to be online to help you with the bones and stuff like that. But it is a way to do that. If you already have a textbook that you're happy with, then you can also just purchase access to this master in A&P, and I think it's like $70. Because the other thing they have in here are some tremendous resources to help you to be successful in understanding this information. One of the easiest ways to do this is to just look in terms of the chapter. Let's pick chapter three because it's more interesting. It shows you the different parts of the e-text if you have that. Uh, there are some videos like that mitosis or DNA replication videos, flashcard maker, uh, bioflix, all sorts of other videos and art labeling activity. There are a tremendous number of resources and great study tools. Notice for each chapter, there are chapter quizzes and chapter practice tests that you can take that can help you to be successful uh, with that. So there's a lot of great tools there. When we are learning our bones or our muscles, we have our practice anatomy lab. When you go to your practice anatomy lab, and this little pop-up window comes up, you gotta make sure you have your pop-ups off for this. So say for instance, when we're learning about the muscles as we'll be doing, and we wanna learn about this, we can show and see on a cadaver, the different muscles, have the labels on, have the labels off. We can go through the different layers, superficial and deep. And that's interesting and that's cool. However, the other thing you're gonna be responsible for is understanding this material on models. So notice we can go to anatomical models, go to muscular system, go to upper limb, and it shows you the models just like we have in the classroom uh, to allow you to be able to study this. There are also quizzes that you can take where you take a quiz and it shows you a muscle, multiple choice, or a lab practical that you can take where you, it shows you a muscle and you actually have to write in the correct answer. The other thing that's on here that I really, really like when we get to muscles is that uh, it has animations, sorry, uh, that we have. So for instance, if we're looking at that bicep brachia, let me know if you guys can hear this. Biceps brachii is a large two-headed flexor muscle located in the anterior compartment of the arm. The origin of the long head is from the supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. The origin of the short head is from the tip of the coracoid process of the scapula. The two heads insert by a common tendon onto the radial tuberosity and by the bicipital aponeurosis, which blends with the deep fascia on the medial aspect of the forearm. Biceps brachii flexes the forearm at the elbow supinates the forearm, and weakly flexes the shoulder. It is innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. So again, as you can see, it, it, it really isolates the individual muscles, shows the attachment points, shows the actions. These are all things that you are going to be responsible for. So notice all of these are things that are going to help you to be really successful in this class, different modalities for learning this material. However, the other thing that's going to be on here, and again, those are just study tools. The other thing that's going to be on here to, that is going to be help you to be successful and also is a graded assignment is the PhysioX. PhysioX, as I mentioned, is one of our lab simulators. So there are videos of this, but where you're going to be doing is going to the exercises. Notice here is exercise one. There are five different activities for exercise one that you're gonna be doing. And each one of these generates a lab report. So you're gonna do those. And remember these are due on a Wednesday, September 9th. So you're gonna go through the activities. I'll just do this really briefly. Uh, read the descriptions, understand the concepts, answer a pre-quiz. Again, notice, <coughs> excuse me. I didn't take any of the quiz questions, but you will. And when you do that, notice you're given the option to submit. So you're gonna submit those to your lab. Then you're gonna go ahead step-by-step, step, grabbing the 20 molecular weight cutoff membrane, putting it in there, follow step-by-step step through all of this, completing the activities. At the end, there are some review sheets you're gonna fill out uh, with deep and meaningful concepts. And then at the end of that, 
it's going to give you a lab report. Now notice my lab report isn't very uh, impressive because I didn't really do anything, but yours will be much more complete than mine is. You are then going to select the printable, savable version. All right, enter your name. And then once you're here, print it or save it as a, what I do, again, because most of you should have this, a PDF printer. So you're just gonna print it. And when you print it, save it as a PDF save it to your desktop, and then this lab report you are going to then turn in. Each individual uh, assignment has its own lab report. So don't do all five and then print the lab report. You'll only get the last one. After you do each activity, you're gonna save this. So let's go ahead and save this to my desktop. On there, boom. All right, and so you're gonna do that. So this is definitely a graded assignment that is gonna be in here, uh, but there are lots of other really amazing resources that you find here in the Master and a &P. And especially because we're dealing with this in the online format, you're gonna to wanna to take as much advantage of that as possible, including the interactive physiology. Interactive physiology also has some great uh, um, uh, directed uh, tutorials to help you to understand this. Uh, there's a chat question, give me a second. Um, thank you, I will work on that. Um, so yes, uh, so again, great resources, definitely take advantage of all these. And like I said, the Physio X is going to be a big part of it as well. All right, so again, those are graded assignments that you can do. So this is something you can access. So you need a textbook, any textbook is fine. Uh, I encourage you to have the textbook for this class because that's the one that I teach to. Again, I'm not sitting here reading the textbook to you, but I am going to uh, talk to it and teach to it that way. Um, that is true, Haley. They did stop it earlier this week, but now they have, uh, they have starting today, they've opened back up the campus again. So it was only closed for a couple of days. Uh, so you can go back to uh, picking up the materials on campus now starting today. So they did reopen campus today. So you are correct. They did close it, uh, end in it last week, but they did open it again today. Unless they've changed it again, I haven't gotten any notification, but uh, I got the email yesterday that campus was open again as of today. Okay, uh, well, we can talk about that during the break or something like that, but, but yes, my understanding is campus is back open now. All righty, so those are the resources. So again, the resources you need, whoops. The resources you need to be successful are going to be a textbook of some sort. Uh, you need the Master in A&P access to get the Physio X. Technically, you can purchase the Physio X as a standalone. So like if you go to Amazon, for instance, you can purchase it, but Physio X is a standalone is like 45 or $50. The Master in A&P is 70. So if, if saving 20 bucks really means that much to you, and I know for some people it does, then yes, you can get away with just the Physio X. But for 20 bucks more, you get so many more resources that are gonna help you to be successful. And again, you're not gonna just use this in 430, you're gonna use this in 431 as well. So I do strongly encourage you to take advantage of that and you need the lab manual. Again, if you piecemeal these things, I do encourage you to get both a photographic atlas and a histology atlas. It doesn't have to be the ones that are in the bundles. The ones that are in the bundles are the ones that are made by those publishers that we like the most. So those are the ones we put in there. But if you can find any histology atlas that you like or any photographic atlas you like, that would be fine as well. All right. Um, hold on. Yes, and if you already have a textbook then, and you don't have access to the Master and a &P, then yes, you can just buy the access code and you do it right there in Canvas. When you log on to the Master and a &P, purchase it there. You can get Pearson stuff by going to their website, but this particular modified Master and a &P is synchronized with Canvas. So uh, it, it's actually different from the one you get from them directly. So you can go into Canvas, purchase it that way. All right. All right, those are the resources you need to be successful. Obviously, you need a microphone, you need a camera uh, for the proctorio exam, those things are required. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of faces, so I'm guessing most of you have those, so that's not an issue as well. 
Uh, we kind of already talked a little bit about uh, what is expected as far as instruction. It's going to be um, mostly this, me talking. Uh, again, I do record these lectures, but there's always technical issues you have to worry about. It takes me a day or three to sometimes get them posted on our YouTube channel. So again, it's easy to fall behind that way. Also, I expect this to be an interactive process, right? As you can see, I talk very fast and this is having, I haven't had my caffeine yet. Just wait till after the first break when I get my cup of coffee, right? Then we'll be flying. Uh, I, I want lectures. I expect lectures to be interactive. I will ask questions, I will expect you to answer them. I expect you to ask questions and I will answer them back. I want them to be interactive. If I didn't, if I didn't care about us being interactive, then I would record the lectures and I'd sleep in, right? That'd be way easier for me. Instead, I'm giving you my time and my effort to do this because I think this is the best way to learn. And so you need to be active in this learning process. I expect this to be interactive. As I said, and I will say many, many times, the only stupid question is the question not asked, right? Think of it this way, if nothing else, if you ask a question, it stops me from talking for two minutes and gives everybody a chance to take a break from that. So again, if you have a question, I guarantee somebody else does, please ask that question, all right? Attendance is expected and required for this class. Uh, like today and uh, Wednesday, I am absolutely positively taking a quiz. Hopefully you took that attendance quiz. Is there anybody here who did not take the attendance quiz? Excellent, all right, so good, perfect. Now there's gonna be an attendance quiz on Wednesday as well as I try to deal with enrollment issues. After that, as far as I'm concerned, I'm hoping by Wednesday, we'll have all the enrollment issues handled, although with the online format and the turnover, I'm not sure that will actually be the case. But eventually, we will stop having to take role at the beginning of class. That doesn't mean that you don't have to be here anymore. There will be daily quizzes. Sometimes they will be at the beginning of class. Sometimes they will be at the end of the lecture uh, to ensure that people are here both at the beginning of class and at the end of lecture as well. Sometimes they will be announced and sometimes they will not. As I already mentioned, uh, I will be breaking you up into groups and group activities. If you're not here and don't get into a group, you're not going to be part of that activity and you're not going to get the points from it. It is important to be here. I understand life happens. I understand that sitting here and trying to listen to me talk for four and a half hours is exhausting. I get exhausted and bored of myself doing it, so I'm sure you will as well. So again, I make the lectures uh, available for you so that you can go back and view them, but it's not an alternative to coming to class. Um, great question. For the daily quizzes, it really depends on if it's, uh, if, uh, this isn't always going to be the case, but let's think of it this way. Being the sophisticated students you are, you guys should think of it this way. Um, if we just had a really hard concept on Monday, then Wednesday's quiz is likely to be on Monday's concept. If, for instance, we're coming back on a Wednesday, after a Monday holiday, and I've encouraged you to look ahead at the material before you come to class on Wednesday and you haven't been in class for a week, there's a chance that that quiz might involve the stuff we're going to be talking about that day. So yes, you should always be prepared for the lecture. You should always be prepared. Now again, remember, the goal of this isn't for you to have mastered this information. So if it's going to be, if I give you a quiz on the information we haven't covered yet, it's going to be more the basic concepts. Right, because if you were already knew this stuff, then you wouldn't have to take this class, right? So I'm not expecting you to have mastered these materials, but uh, it will sometimes be on the stuff that we're going to cover that day, or sometimes the stuff we've covered up, kind of leading up to it. Great question. There are five point quizzes, uh, five questions, mul all multiple choice, uh, and you'll have five minutes to take it. All right. Um, group assignments, again, those things. All homeworks are due at the beginning of class. Um, you can turn assignments in up to one week late, but only for half credit. On test days, uh, you will be taking both the lab and the lecture uh, quiz. Again, they're tests, but they're quiz called quizzes in, uh, in the Proctorio thing. On the same day, you may take them in either order that you want. You can take the lab exam first or the lecture exam first, uh, but both exams must be completed within the class time. So they will become available at eight, you don't have to start at eight, uh, but uh, they, all, they all need to be done by 1235. If you log on to the lab exam at 1215, then you're only gonna have 20 minutes to complete it and then you're gonna get kicked out. 
So make sure you give yourself enough time, whether it's technical issues, whether you want to take the lab exam first and then take a break and take the lecture exam. However you want to do it is fine that way, but they must be completed within the class time. So if you know you've had problems with your computers before, don't wait to the last minute to start the exam. Start early so that we have time to work through those things. Uh, if you do get kicked out of an exam, uh, you either lose your connection or you do something that causes you to get kicked out. Uh, you can get back in, but to do that, you have to contact Proctorio Support. They're really good at responding. They're really good at getting you back into the exams. I cannot get you back into an exam. So don't contact me, contact Proctorio Support. They will be the ones that get you back in, but be aware your clock is still ticking. So the time still counts even if you get kicked out. So make sure you get back in and complete that in a timely fashion. All right. Anybody here play golf? Uh, sir, um, regarding, regarding the exam, you said if you're kicked out uh, because of the technical issues, so there will be not second chance or you will not have another chance to do it? Uh, so, uh, so again, hopefully, we, I know you haven't taken the proctorio exam, but one of, one of the things that I found, and again, one of the reasons why I made this one of the questions, for those of you who've taken the proctorio exam, one of the things you have to do is use the magnification tool inside of uh, proctorio to enlarge the screen so that you can see an image that I've made really small, and then you can shrink it back down. Uh, when you're taking a lab exam, maybe when you're looking at a picture from the lab exam, uh, you're having trouble seeing something. And one of the issues that I figured out that people were having is if you have a Mac, there's a way on your Mac with your mouse or something, I don't know, some weird Mac thing, where you can actually enlarge the screen. If you enlarge the screen uh, by enlarging the screen, Proctorio will kick you out for doing that. So you have to use the tool that they have in there. Now, if you get kicked out for that, then, uh, then you can contact Proctorio Support and they will let you back in. So for those type of technical things that will kick you out, um, then yes, they can get, you can get back in for that. Okay? All right, so one person has played golf. Has anybody here heard of golf before? Seen a golf ball? Okay, there you go, excellent. Daniel, if you hit a 300 yard drive, how many strokes does that count as? One, excellent. If you hit a two inch putt, how many strokes does that count as? One, exactly. When you play golf, strokes are strokes are strokes. In this class, points are points are points. Five points on a homework assignment, count the same as five points in a physio X, count the same as five points on a lab exam, count the same as five points on a lecture exam. Your job in this class is to fill your bucket with as many points as you have. We're gonna finish this class with somewhere around 12 to 1300 points. Your job is to get 90% of them. If you can get 90% of the points in this class, you will get an A. It's just that simple. And if every single person in this class gets 90% 90 of the points, every single person in this class gets an A. One of the great things about that is it's not competitive. You guys can work together. Your grade doesn't determine anybody else's grade in this class. So it's to your advantage to form groups, to meet virtually, to do those things, to help yourself to be successful. Use those tools that are gonna help you to be successful. And one of the greatest ways to learn something is to teach it to somebody else. All right, if two of us sit down and talk about a concept together, we're both gonna understand it better. And so that's your job, maximize your points in this class. I will do some things to help you. There will be extra credit opportunities. The five for five is a great example of it. I will curve the exams. Again, it's not gonna be a traditional curve. Proctorio doesn't allow you to do that, but I will curve the grades uh, on the exams usually for that. Um, your final exam, this is a cumulative class. So everything we talk about is information you need, especially as you move on to 431. I didn't randomly pick the topics for this class out of a hat. The things we are learning are things we're gonna need both for this class and for 431 moving forward. So it is to your benefit to maintain this information. And so one of the ways you can do that and show that you've done that is by taking a cumulative final exam. That cumulative final exam counts as a grade on its own, but it can also replace your lowest lecture score. 
All right, this is important. Let's go back to the whiteboard and clear this, all right? Again, this point, this class is about points and let's talk about your lecture exams. All the lecture exams are gonna be worth 100. Wow, that is really huge. It's gonna be worth 100 points, all right? It is gonna be a combination of multiple choice questions, a fill in the blank and essay questions. And you have five total lecture exams. So let's say your five lecture exams, your first one, you got a 78, really didn't appreciate what anatomy and physiology was gonna be like. So you, maybe you took it a little bit easy. I stumbled a little bit, brought it up for the second, did pretty good for the third. And then right before the fourth exam, grandma got married in Vegas. And when grandma got married in Vegas, you didn't have as much time to study. And so you stumbled a little bit and ended up with a 64. You rallied for the last exam and brought it back up to an 81. And those are your five exam scores for the class. Now, as I mentioned, your final counts as a grade on its own. And let's say for instance, you get an 83 on the final. Not only does it count as a grade on its own, but I will allow you to replace your lowest lecture score with that final score. And suddenly you just had 19 points added back into your grade. Yes, it's okay to stumble on an exam. Many of you will stumble on this first exam because despite all the warnings, all the doom and gloom, as scary as I try to be, you won't believe me and you're gonna get hammered on that first exam. Or maybe because you kind of know what your elbow is and your armpit is and things like that, maybe you don't do too bad on this first test. And then on the second test, when it's all tissues, epithelial tissues and connective tissues and skin uh, histology slides, maybe you'll get hammered on that one. Or maybe your grandma gets married in Vegas and you're just really busy that weekend. I understand the students stumble, I, but the point is for you to master this material. And if at the end of the semester, you can show me that you've learned that material by being successful on the final exam, I will reward you for that success. The other thing that's gonna help you to be successful is I'm going to give you 15 participation points. This is not extra credit. This is an assignment, 15 out of 15. Be here, be active in the learning process. Again, I know I would love active in the learning process to be, you must ask questions. Everybody must ask two questions a week. No, I, I know not everybody's comfortable doing that. And again, but be active in the learning process. When we do group activities, be active in your group. Be here on time, participate in the class. <clears throat> do the assignments and turn them in on time. Be respectful of the people in the classroom. If you can do all of those things, you will keep your 15 participation points. Right, everybody has 15 participation points right now. It's a grade 15 out of 15. It's the only grade you have right now in this class. Congratulations, everybody here has an A. Your job is now to maintain it. Extra credit, uh, there are a couple extra credit opportunities we'll talk about. I don't do outside extra credit, really. All the extra credit is related to the class. Because what happens is if you do poorly on the first exam and you come to me and ask for an extra credit assignment and I give you some paper to write, Every minute you spend writing that paper is a minute you're not studying for the second part of the class. And so when the test on the second part of the class comes around, you're not going to be as successful at that. And then you need another extra credit assignment. And then you're poured on the third. And then suddenly it's independent study. And that's not what we're looking for. So I don't do extra credit assignments that way. Extra credit involves the class. But there's extra credit. There's curves. There's participation. There's replacing a grade with your final. I will do everything I can to help you to be successful. However, if at the end of the semester, you have 89.7% of the points in this class, what is your grade going to be? An A, hopefully. Nope. What do you need to get an A in this class? 90. 90, and guess what? 89.7 is less than 90. If at the end of the semester, with extra credit, 
with participation, with curving the grades, with replacing an exam with your final, with all that help, if you still don't have 90% of the points, then you did not earn an A. Because without all that help, you probably weren't even close to it. So I will be very, very strict about that. I will do everything I can to help you along the way. You'll have your grades in the grade book so you'll know exactly where you are and what kind of things you need to do to be successful. And like I said, I'm gonna do a lot of things to help you, but at the end of the day, your points determine your grade. And if you don't get 90% of the points, you don't get the A. All right. Questions on that? All right. Um, I think those are all the big things that we wanted to talk about that way. Uh, quick classroom policies. Uh, again, because of the pace of the class, because of the clumsiness of Canvas and Proctorio, uh, makeup exams is something that is incredibly challenging to find time to do. So the class policy is that there are no makeup exams. All right, that is the class policy. However, as you look at this schedule, if you see, oh no, grandma really is getting married in Vegas on the day of the third exam, and you let me know that now, then uh, I will make every attempt to make an exception for you. But because of timing, because of the pace, because of the, quite frankly, the clunkiness of Canvas and Proctorio, it's not always gonna be possible for me to be able to uh, allow for makeup exams. I will make every effort, but I can't guarantee it. And so since I can't guarantee it, the classroom uh, policy is that there are no makeups, uh, but I will try to make an exception for you. Now, you only get one exception. If grandma's getting married in Vegas and uh, you are gonna miss that test and we're able to make other accommodations, then excellent, that is perfect. I encourage you to do that. Uh, and we will uh, make those arrangements if we can, but that's the only time we'll make that arrangement. So if you miss a test for any other reason, you will get a zero. Again, it's about maintaining the consistency of the class, maintaining the integrity of the class. I can make an exception once, but I can't do it for more than one exam. All right. Um, Accommodations, if you require any kind of accommodations, please get, uh, we have a great service on campus, the DSPS, uh, that is excellent at providing accommodations uh, for you to be able to help you to be successful. So contact them, get the paperwork to me so that we can, or have them contact me so that we can get that done. Academic honesty, right? Here's the doom and gloom stuff. American River College values academic honesty. Current policies prohibit dishonesty, such as cheating, plagiarism, or knowingly furnishing false information to the college. All members of the academic community are responsible for the academic integrity of American River College. There is the obvious stuff on that. Uh, as I mentioned, I had the fun and enjoyment of teaching summer school. And on my very first test in summer school, I had a student sitting on his computer, taking the exam, and he would lean in and he would read the question. And then he'd turn around to the stack of papers he had behind him and look through the stack of papers behind him and come back and start writing on the exam, all right? Clearly, he got a zero for that exam, right? Those are the obvious types of things. Uh, the things that are less obvious but are important is the scanning of your work area. Again, in the classroom, I have the ability to observe you as a student. I don't have that opportunity. So the more you can do to show me uh, that you are in an environment that is conducive to learning and not conducive to cheating, the better off you are going to be. I have three examples of the appropriate way to scan your work area. Have a clean work area. Don't have papers. Don't have electronic devices. Don't have another computer screen sitting on the table next to you. Yes, when you showed it to me, it was off, but how do I know it doesn't come back on at some point? Right, so again, I, this, I, this is not an easy format for these things. I realize that this is not the most ideal situation. And again, this is one of those examples of where the process gets in the way of the learning uh, method, but we have to deal with this thing. So that if you can show me that your work area is clean, then I can be less worried when you're thinking and staring off to space. If you haven't done a good job of showing me your work area, then when you look, every time you look to the left, just because you're thinking, 
how do I know that you're really just thinking and not reading something that's over there or looking at a computer screen or doing something like that? So again, you want to, um, great question. We want to uh, minimize the opportunity for dishonesty to ensure the integrity of this class. So do those things, show your area well, um, and uh, again, limit how much you're looking around. Don't have any electronic devices or other papers and things like that are on there. And again, there's some great examples on uh, in our getting started that show you how to do that. Uh, you ha should have an appropriate amount of time to be able to answer and complete the exams, yes. Again, it is, they are timed exams, just like they're timed exams in the classroom. You're limited on the amount of time that you have. In fact, uh, that's one of the few advantages here in the lab exam than to the classroom. When we do a timed lab exam in the classroom, I present you one image at a time. You get to see that answer image, you write down the answer, and then the next one comes up. On our lab exams here, you will have all of the questions available at once. So you can go through them in any order. And if you're looking at one and think, oh, I'm not sure how this relates to 14, you can actually scroll back up to 14 and see that. You can't actually do that in the classroom. So again, the one concern about that is if you're constantly scrolling up and down the exam, uh, then that takes a lot more time. So yes, you have uh, what should be an appropriate amount of time if you have prepared properly for the exam. And again, you have a running clock that will tell you what that is going to be. All right, so again, those are the obvious types of things. What's sometimes less obvious, especially when I put you in groups, is that when I put you in groups, I want you working on materials together. There are assignments, I want you working together to discuss it, because it's a good way to learn it. But when it comes time to answer the questions associated with that, I want you writing those in your own words. I don't want to see four paragraphs that are all identical to each other from four different people, because if you work together to come up with the answer, that's great. But when it comes time to describe it, just like when it comes time to describe it on the exam, um, when it comes time to describe it on the exam, uh, you need to do it in your own words. So again, just make sure you describe something in your own words. Hold on, I've got a student who's having some problems getting in. Um, where is the... I need to stop sharing. Oh no, that's what I want. So can you text or email her? Oops. Hold on. Do, do, do. That is the link to this site. So if you click, if you send her that, that should get her back in directly if she's having trouble getting back in. Because it's not locked or anything, so that shouldn't be an issue. Okay, thank you. Yep. All righty. Uh, so that is the uh, part of the doom and gloom. One last doom and gloom. Oh, uh, no smart watches, no smart devices of any type out. Describe things in your own words. Uh, drop in the class. Obviously, if you're not here today, well, you're not hearing this, I guess unless you're watching the video later, in which case you're screwed. Uh, you are going to be dropped during the first break, uh, but same thing for Wednesday. Uh, there are some people who, again, didn't have their prerequisites. If you didn't have your prerequisite, you should have gotten an email from me. You should have gotten multiple emails from me. In fact, if there's anybody who didn't get at least two emails from me, you do not have your email set up properly with admissions. So make sure in e-services you have your email set up correctly because you should be getting that properly. Uh, so be here today, be here Wednesday. If you're not here Wednesday, there's going to be an attendance quiz just like last time. If you don't take that, um, <coughs> I'll answer that in a question in a second. You will be dropped. But after that, this is college, you're adults, you're responsible for your schedules. So once I get the enrollment set, again, I will drop people to make room for people that want to be here. But after those three weeks, if you decide this isn't for you and you want to bail, that's great, that's fine. Uh, but you're responsible for your schedule. One of the things that I will remind you is you are only able to take classes like this three times. So if you take this and don't drop it and get a grade, get an F, that counts as one of your three attempts. So make sure you don't waste that. The last day to drop without a W where it doesn't count as one of your three attempts is September 6th. And the last time to drop with a W is November 17th. All right, that is the doom and gloom stuff. Let's finish things off 
Yowzers. Uh, with the um, positive things, what you can do to be successful, don't miss class, don't skip any work. One of the things I said is what I love about our lab manuals is that uh, they're like workbooks. And in fact, at the beginning of each section is a pre-lab where it's some labeling activities, some identification activities, some vocabulary activities. It is a great resource to help you to be successful. There are very few of those that you'll be turning in, but if you actually take the time to do them, they will be a great study tool that will help you to be successful as we move forward of that. So be here again, be here, ask questions, participate in the class. You're spending a lot of money to be here. You're spending a lot of time to be here. Uh, the textbooks, uh, Atlas, all those things, exactly. Uh, so be active in the learning process. If this isn't making sense, if, if what I'm saying isn't clear to you, then ask the question because it doesn't do you any good to sit here and have the information bounce off you if you're not retaining it. Maybe having me word it a different way. Maybe having somebody else help to explain or things that can be helpful. So you gotta be active in the learning process. And like I said, when I ask questions, I want answers back. Like I said, I have no problem recording the lectures and sleeping in. Actually, I don't work that way, but I don't, I, it's what I could do. If I, I want you to interact, I want questions, I want that. Make sure you do your homework, turn it in on time. It is so easy to get points for studying by doing, putting time and effort into your homework. Like I said, you don't have to worry about if they're right. Now, obviously you have to be worried about having the right information for the exams, but I'm giving you points for studying. So what you need to do is make sure you're putting time and effort into it and turning them in on time. I had a student two semesters ago, granted it was before we, actually I guess three now, before we came online, who got A's on all the tests, but didn't bother turning any of the homework in on time. And he ended up with a B in the class. So again, you're getting free points for studying. Take advantage of it. Develop good study habits. Hopefully at this point, you know what helps you to be successful. I'm a very tactile and a very visual learner. So flashcards work really well for me, uh, both the writing of them out, although you can buy some great anatomy and physiology uh, flashcards. Being a tactile learner, I like to be able to write them out. It helps, looking at them helps me to study. For processes, what I find is describing it out loud. As I mentioned, a great way to learn something is to teach it to somebody else. But if you can describe a process out loud, you own that process, right? Make one bunny ear, make a second bunny ear. The first bunny ear goes around the second bunny ear, through the bunny hole, pull it tight, right? I own the process of tying a shoe. And if you try to describe a process in your own words, very quickly, you will learn what parts of it you know and what parts of it you don't know. It'll help you to get that very, very easily. Take advantage of the groups. You'll be forming groups, like I said, to do group activities. There's a discussion board you can get onto uh, and form groups to study. Uh, there's an open lab, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Take advantage of me. Come to my office hours. You guys have a huge advantage. Office hours are right after class. So as soon as I'm done yammering here, we will switch over to my office. And if you have questions, you can follow me and we can continue to discuss it. Uh, for those of you who have not taken advantage of the five for five, uh, you can come to my office hours and we will do that today. Today will be an opportunity. There's going to be a lot more of you, so you'll be sitting in the waiting room for a lot longer period of time, but that's what you get for waiting. Uh, and then again, lastly, be courteous to your fellow students. I appreciate people have kids, people have dogs, people have work, people have lives, all sorts of things going on. Mm -hmm. Try to minimize the distractions to the class. Uh, if you have to answer the phone or, or if you have a dog going crazy, mute your, your mic. In fact, if you want to have it muted all the time and just turn it on when you want to ask questions, that's fine. If you just want to text questions like people are doing it, that is fine as well. The one thing I do ask to try to be good about is that if it is a general question, please try to text it to the group so that others can see it. I'll always try to rephrase the question as we go through it. But if you just have a private question for me, it's okay to send me that private thing. But if it's a general question, I do encourage you to do that. All right, I think that is it. Questions on any of that? All right, so let me do, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a break. Um, before we can do that though, I need to figure out, all right, so let's do it this way because this is gonna take me a few moments to do this. So let's do this. So here's the plan. If you are, I need a pen. Uh, 
All right, if you are enrolled in the class, then what you do is you're welcome to leave. I'm gonna probably need about 15 minutes, so let's come back at, let's call it 926. Come back at 926 and we will start the lecture at that point. If you are uh, waitlisted and trying to add the class, I need a minute to see who's here and who's not here to figure out who has priority to be able to add and people that I will be giving ad slips to. Uh, what I would encourage you to do, and again, uh, I'm not going to be able to add everybody today, but I will add as many as I can. Uh, for those of you that I don't add today, what I would encourage you to do is to stay. Stay and listen to the rest of the introduction. Stay and listen to the lecture. Get the information so that if you're able to add on Wednesday, I'll be able to add you. There are a couple people uh, that don't have their prerequisites. If they are here, they need to get those prerequisites to me. So those are people that I will have to talk to. Uh, so there is the chance that I'll be able to, and I'll, I'll do my best to scare some people off between now and Wednesday. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. you are welcome and encouraged to stick around, get the information so you can stay in the class and be successful. Uh, and then uh, hopefully we'll be able to add more students on Wednesday. So let's go ahead and, and take that break. I need two minutes to figure out how many people I'll be able to add. Uh, those uh, people I'll list off and I will get you your ad numbers so that you can do that and add the class and then actually what I'll do is I'll have you email me and I'll send it to you that way. We'll do that. Uh, but let me figure out who those people are. And then, like I said, for the rest of you, if you don't get in today, I encourage you to hang around and uh, get the information and we'll see what happens. And then uh, we'll be back here at 926. Uh, All right. So give me uh, 52 minutes to figure out who's here and who's not. Last call. Did anybody not fill out the daily quiz? Speak now or be forever dropped from the class. All right, two minutes and I'll tell you who I'm able to add. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> All right, so it looks like I'm going to be able to add six people. So uh, yeah, let's do it this way. Oh, there's a bunch of questions. Um, yes, daily quiz is just a single question. Chemistry quiz has to be taken before Wednesday, yes. All right. Excuse me, Professor. Um, yes. Amy is still having a hard time trying to get back into the um, back into the meeting. She's unable to get into the meeting, so she's on the waiting list. What's the name? Amy. Amy. Yeah. Okay. So tell her. 
Tell mm -hmm. her to email, tell her to email me, and I will send her the uh, I will send her the link to uh, the Canvas. I mean, to the Zoom, and hopefully she can get in that way. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. So like I said, we'll be able to add six people. So Amy Ba, who's having the problems, uh, Allison Steed, um, Marie Bennett, uh, Partik Singh, Daisy Chavez, and Van Marcus James Vega. So those six, I need you to send me an email. And what I will do is I will email you uh, the ad slip. Uh, I'll say this now for everybody who's trying to add so that you can hear this. Um, what we will do is that you have, um, I will send you the ad slip. You need to sign the ad slip by, uh, or you fill the ad slip out, so add into the class by tomorrow. What happens is the computer only updates overnight. So what happens is if you log in today, I don't see you officially on the roster until tomorrow. If you wait till tomorrow to add, I won't see you until Wednesday morning. If Wednesday morning before class, I do not see you on the roster, you lose your priority and you are no longer able to add. So this ad, uh, the ad number I will email you is only good for 24 hours. So if you're, not in the, uh, if you're not in the class Wednesday morning, then you lose your priority and I will add somebody else instead. All right, so those six people, uh, again, uh, please uh, send me an email and I will give you the ad number uh, so that you are able to add the class. For the rest of you, I encourage you to stick around, get the information. Like I said, there I may scare a couple people off. There are two people who don't have their prerequisites that I've already sent a second email to that I haven't heard from. If I don't hear from them or they don't have their prerequisites, they could get dropped. So there is still an opportunity to get more people in. So I don't want you to lose hope if you're not on the list. There's also two, three, four, five. There were seven people on the wait list who didn't show up as well. So even if you were like 19th on the wait list, uh, you may now be fourth on the wait list because of all the people that didn't show up as well. So again, uh, and again, I can't drop them from the wait list, but by not being here today, they've lost their priority. So your priority moves ahead of them. So those people have lost their priority for doing that as well. All right, questions on any of that? All right, I need to go run and get some coffee. I will meet you guys back here at 926. So let's do this. Started at 926 and all right. <clears throat> so any questions before we get rolling? No. All right, excellent. So one last little bit of introductory stuff we need to deal with. Uh, I think most of you hopefully have some familiarity with uh, Canvas now, but there are a couple things that uh, I, common questions that I have that I want to quickly address uh, right now. One of the things that obviously you here's your main page, uh, the direct link to my office hours. Remember the confer Zoom we're only using for lecture, so all my office hours are basically this is my office phone number on campus, so we're using that as our Zoom room. So that's a, a, a static room that is there and that's what we'll do it be doing our office hours after class and any other time if you still need to do the five for five meeting uh, after class today i will be there and you'll have the opportunity to do that if you can't make our office hour right after class today i do have office hours from 11 to 12 tomorrow if you come during my office hours you don't need an appointment just show up i will have a waiting room set up so that i'm only seeing students one at a time so you may have to sit there for a little bit but if i'm there and the waiting room is open, know that I'm there and I will see you shortly. If those times don't work for you, then email me and we will try to make other arrangements. All right, obviously the announcements, you guys know all what those things are. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to point out that I think are important, because again, not everybody knows this. What I like a lot about the syllabus page, and I don't think a lot of people realize, is that yes, it has the syllabus and all the information include a downloadable version of it. But at the bottom, 
It has the course summary, which tells you when everything for the entire semester, every assignment is going to be due, when that assignment is due, the day that it is due, the quizzes, the exams, everything is here. So if you ever have a question about where something's due, not only is it at the beginning of the lectures, but you also have it here under syllabus. So that's gonna be important. Uh, obviously, you know the quizzes, um, but where you should be spending most of your time is here in the modules. The modules are where you're gonna get to, come on, there we go, hold on. Yeah. Um, where you're gonna to get to most of the information you're gonna need. So for instance, here's where the introductory assignments and things are located. Those correct way to scan your testing areas are located here for you to observe as well. Here are some great study websites that have some great histology or models materials that you can use, as well as information about our open lab. Open lab normally on campus is an opportunity uh, where you get the chance to come in and spend more time with the bones or the microscopes or the muscles. In class, we'll have the opportunity to go through them, but it's not gonna be enough to master the information. So it is more important that you be able to um, have that opportunity to get more time with the materials. Now, obviously you're not gonna get that hands-on, but what we do have available for you is our instructional assistant by the name of Jeff Chingaris is an amazing instructor. And um, <clears throat> his job is basically on Fridays to be on camera. He's got two cameras set up. He's got a lot of resources and he's there to help you to master this material. So if you're having trouble telling the difference between the frame and ovale and the frame and rotundum and the skull, you can get online, you can ask him about it, uh, and he will show you the skull and show it from all different points of views and put a probe through it and do all those things to help you to master it. Now it is an open lab, so anybody can come in, including people from 431 as well. So when you first log in, you may be showing somebody from 431 a heart or a spleen or something along those lines, but give him five, 10 minutes and he'll switch topics. He's pretty good that way. It's also an opportunity to meet with other 430 students who are working on similar things to learn and master this material. You can even form breakout groups in there. If you ask him, he can set you guys up with your own room to study this material. And it is a great way to help to master this material, get some free time to, to learn this stuff, and to reward you for doing that for every hour you spend in Open Lab. What you do when you log into Open Lab is you tell Jeff that you are there, log, you'll sign in with him. And then when you leave, you'll sign out. Make sure you sign in and sign out. If you don't sign in, you don't get credit for being there. If you don't sign out, your time defaults to one hour. So make sure that you are there. And if you do that, if you go and spend any time in the open lab, you can get up to 15 points of extra credit. Now, again, I encourage you to spend as much time as possible there. He's there from 10.30 to 8.30. If you can put 50 hours into open lab, uh, great. But you're not gonna get 50 points of extra credit. It tops out at 15. But know that 15 hours in open lab is going to give you those 15 points of extra credit. <clears throat> but it's going to help you to be much more successful on the exams. And it's going to give you much more than those 15 points on the test themselves. So it is a really worthwhile activity to take advantage of. Each section, like we have here, section one, which we're in now, is going to have the assignments. This is where you will come to turn in an assignment. So again, with your unit one review, There we go. It reminds you of the page numbers that they are. You can, uh, again, you can print it as a PDF. You can take pictures of your pages and then just do it that way, but you will submit them here. I encourage you to put your name on your assignments, but what I will remind you is that uh, these submit uh, boxes that you're, uh, drop boxes that you're putting these in are unique for you. So what that means is when you put it in there, it already has your name on it for me. So again, you, it's always a good idea to put your name on things, but it isn't required to say, hey, you know, this is Billy turning in my assignment because I'll know who I'm getting that from. But that is where you're going to turn in your assignments. Uh, for that part, this is also where the lecture handouts are going to be. All of the slides that we're going to be going over are going to be located here. Uh, so we can talk about that later. Um, the lab handouts 
that are going to be here. This particular one, again, we're not going to have a lot of time with microscopes, but you're going to be responsible for a lot of histology. So taking three-dimensional structures and slicing them into thin pieces that are basically two-dimensional and then trying to recreate them can be challenging. There isn't any homework assignment associated with this, but it is something that can help you to be successful. The other thing that is in here are the lab simulators. Again, we have four of them for this section, three of them in Lapster, and one of them in the Physio X that we're gonna be looking on. Remember also I said that your homework assignments, these unit reviews are being graded for completeness, not correction. So as long as you're putting time and effort into them, you are gonna get the points. But obviously you wanna make sure you have the right information. So on a day that an assignment is due, when you complete that unit one review, the key for it is gonna populate here that afternoon. So that way you have a chance to go back and double check to make sure that you had the correct information and that you had it right, okay? I will sometimes do drawings or other things in lab, I mean in lecture or lab too. And so if I do those, I'll save those images and often print up, uh, publish them here so you get a chance to see those as well. So this is where you're gonna spend most of the uh, your time your grades are located here. Access to the MyLab and Mastering is located here. And your discussion boards are here. I've set up a water cooler, which again is just an opportunity for you guys to use that however you want, to form groups, to complain about how hard the class is, right? talk about how horrible the giants are, whatever makes you happy, this is there for, there for you. When we form our groups, I will also give you group discussion boards that you will have here so that you can communicate asynchronously with your group as well. All right, questions on any of that? I actually, I don't know, I haven't, I, I'm a Reds fan and they're horrible. So I just, I just assume the Giants are horrible. Aren't the Giants always horrible these days? They're not the A's, I know that. That's uh, a fluke. All right. <laughs> Excellent. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right, perfect. Excellent. So I think that's most of the important things that you'll need to be successful. Uh, well, and then I'm sure they're going to lose Bumgarner soon too. So, <coughs> all righty. So that is our introduction. We're finally done with all of that. Thankfully done with all of that. So now what we can finally focus on is diving into the lecture. So this is our goal now, to start talking about this. Now again, as I mentioned, and this is a perfect example of this, I have talked for an hour and a half now, and clearly that's not on the slides. So again, remember the slides are a great outline that are gonna help you to be successful. Wait, what's going on here? There we go, okay, that was wonky. <clears throat> the slides are a great resource. They're an outline, but again, you're responsible for everything we talk about. Not necessarily just what's on the slides, you're responsible for everything we talk about in class. They're an outline. So think of them in those terms. Now, as I mentioned, I don't do outside extra credit, but I do do extra credit involving the class that helps you to be successful. As I mentioned, you can go to the open lab. If you go to that open lab, for at least 15 hours, you can get 15 points of X credit. And again, if because your work schedule and things like that, you can only get to seven and a half, then you'll get seven and a half points of extra credit. You know, for every hour you spend there, uh, you will get a point of extra credit. The other extra credit opportunity that you can have is the Science Success Center. The, success, the Science Success Center is a half unit class that you sign up for that basically helps you to be successful in science, hence the name. It is actually based on a program that was developed uh, for a med school up in, I think it was like Minnesota or something like that. This med school in Minnesota was finding that they were having a 50% attrition rate with their first year med students. Half of the med students were failing in their first year of medical school. And so they were trying to figure out why. And so they did this big research study and what they found out, shocker of all shocks, med students are smart. And that's the problem. Now, and I know that sounds counterintuitive, but if you think about it, someone who's made it into med school, did they ever have to crack the textbook when they were in high school? Didn't you hate those people who slept in the basket of the class and always got A's? 
right? Those people always bug me, right? Absolutely, right? They didn't have to crack a book in high school. Many of them didn't have to crack a book in, uh, in undergraduate of, of university. They never had to learn how to be successful in a classroom. They didn't have to learn how to take notes. They didn't have to know how to prepare for an exam. They didn't have to know how to read a textbook because they were able to be successful because they were really smart. But then they got to med school where everybody's really smart and they didn't have the tools that helped them to be successful. So what they did is they set up this program. Great question. I'll answer that in just a minute, Jawad. Um, they set up this program that basically helps students to learn how to read a textbook, learn how to manage their time, learn how to do all these things. And they saw great success from that. And so we kind of incorporated that into something for science in general. The good news is if you've taken it before, and I see some of you have, uh, you do have the opportunity to take it. I think up to three times you can take the class. So it is something that can be done again to help you to be successful. So if you do the Science Success Center and complete it, you basically meet for six to eight weeks for half an hour a week at a time of your choosing with an instructor, uh, complete the activities, and you will get 15 points of extra credit for that. Now you can do, I encourage you to do both the Science Success Center and the Open Lab, but you can't double up on the extra credit. So you'll get 15 points of extra credit either way that you do it. All right. Questions on that? <clears throat> All right. So I, we're teaching the Bio 430 class here, the Advanced Anatomy and Physiology, but I have taught the 102 before. And one of my favorite things to do in the 102 class on the first exam is to actually ask this as the first question, to ask what is anatomy and physiology? And you would be shocked at how many people four weeks into a class can't answer that. So let's get it out of the way here. How do we define anatomy? What is the definition of anatomy? Anatomy is the structure of the organ body or the structure of the body. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's the, I like that. It's the study of the structures of the body. Absolutely. All right? How does that differ from physiology? What is physiology then? Study of the functions of the body. Study the functions of the body, excellent. Perfect, excellent, right? So there you go. Study of the structures, study of the functions of the body. That is what the definition is. And are these things related to each other? Yes. Absolutely, does the shape of something determine what its function is? Does the function of something determine what its shape is going to be? Yes, absolutely, absolutely that is going to be the case. Right, and so that's gonna be the case here too. That's why we teach it together. We teach anatomy and physiology together because they go hand in hand with each other. And it's just so much more intuitive that way. Now, one of the important things to remember is this is very broad general categories. There are all sorts of levels or subdivisions to this. Right, here is a small list. And again, don't feel you have to furiously write these all down. Because like I said, this is just a fraction of them, but it does give us an idea of kind of what we're talking about here. There's, while anatomy is the study of the structures, there's lots of different ways that we're capable of doing that. Surface anatomy, gross anatomy, systemic anatomy. What's gross anatomy? That's the icky stuff? Uh, the, whatever we see, we can see from the Okay, I like that. Things that can be seen, that's good. You know, larger structures. What would the opposite of gross anatomy be? Macro. Yeah, microscopic anatomy. Excellent, right? What's surface anatomy? Skin. Skin. Wouldn't that be dermatology? It is dermatology, but uh, surface probably includes maybe further than uh, dermatology. Well, yeah, there you go, exactly, I like that. It is, it includes dermatology, but it's more than just the skin, right? Think of it this way, back in his heyday, right? He's old and wrinkly now, but back in his heyday, if we brought Arnold Schwarzenegger into the classroom, greased him up and he flexed for us, yeah, we could see his skin, but wouldn't we also be able to see the definition and be able to identify the individual muscles of his body that way? Yes. Or if we 
rolled Kate Moss into the classroom, wouldn't be able to count her ribs and be able to see the skeleton uh, inside of her body, right? Surface anatomy are things that can be seen or felt from the surface of the body. So there's all these different ways that we can study anatomy. And if anatomy has many subdivisions, then does the same thing hold true for physiology? Yes, yeah. Yeah, okay, a little bit more enthusiasm for the easy questions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, there you go, exactly. Yes, absolutely. And so we can see absolutely there are lots of different ways we can divide the subdivisions of physiology as well. All right. <clears throat> now, our goal, not just in 430, but in 430 and 431, is to understand the components of the body, right? And how the body is made. All living things are made up of common elements, but those common elements aren't just thrown together randomly. They appear in a hierarchy. What do I mean by a hierarchy? Step by Smallest step, there are steps, sequences. Yeah, I like that. A sequence of units, obviously from smallest to largest. That's a great way of describing it, right? Politics is on everybody's mind right now. And that's a great example, right? At the top is the president and then the vice president. And then I think they're dukes. I don't know. No one understands politics. Let's talk about something more important, football, right? In football, you have the top, you have the head coach, and then an offensive coordinator, a defensive coordinator, and then a quarterback coach and a linebacker coach and all of these. We have this hierarchy. And the same thing is true for the human body as well, right? If we were to study the human body, what is the lowest possible layer, lowest level that we could talk about it in a meaningful fashion? What's the is most there? basic? Basic component we could break the body down into. Say again? Chemicals, I like that. Atoms? Yeah, chemicals, absolutely, right? Atoms, molecules, et cetera, Girls. stuff like that. Yeah. Recovered cover it again. And turn to, make sure you turn the fire down. Not all the way down, but turn it down. All right. Now, <clears throat> when we take those chemicals and put them together, in just the right fashion, in just the right form, we put those chemicals together to form what next level of our hierarchy? Organelles. True, although organelles are really a part of cells. You got the right uh, idea. Cells and organelles. Oh my gosh, they just heard me. Because remember, organelles um, are a component of cells, but not all cells have organelles. So we have those cells. Now, if I have a bucket of chemicals, does that mean that I have a cell? No. No. It has to be put together in a meaningful way. And there's in particular something really important and special about cells that we don't see in chemicals. What do we, when we talk about cells versus when we talk about, you know, carbon or water or even glucose, what's Not different you. about cells? Nucleus and cytoplasm. Oh, okay, cytoplasm, I'll give you. Not all cells have nuclei, though, right? Yeah. What else? What else is the big difference between cells and chemicals? Uh, they start to develop functions. True, they have all sorts of different functions, and, and although you could argue that chemicals have functions as well. DNA. True, most cells have DNA. I think you guys are overthinking this, though, a little bit. So the Golgi, uh, Golgi apparatus or a Golgi body in the cells, maybe Again, not in Not all ones are going to have them, but you guys are, there you go. That's what I was looking. Kaylee hit it on the head, right? You guys, I think we're overthinking this a little too much. The biggest difference between cells and chemicals is life. Cells are the smallest, and I, I like that, a smallest level of life. We don't talk about water being alive or carbon being alive or sugar being alive, but cells are alive. Now, you guys absolutely hit on a lot of those characteristics of life. So you were hinting around at it, right? Being able to metabolize, being able to respond to their environment, being able to grow, being able to reproduce. All of those are characteristics of life right, that we have from life, but uh, we get those in cells. Now, you put a bunch of cells together, and when we put a bunch of cells together, what do we get from that? Tissue. Tissues, excellent. Again, just any old random bucket of cells going to give us tissues? 
No, but again, there's got to be rules. And with tissues, the rule is that the cells have to be similar. Notice, not identical, but similar. And how do they have to be similar? What are the two ways you think that they have to be similar? Structure. Excellent. In structure. Function. And, or, there you go, function. So we need cells that are similar, not identical, but similar in structure and function. We put those together and we can get a tissue. We put tissues together to form what? Organs. Organs. Organs, excellent. How many? How many tissues do I actually have to put together? If I have a big, huge, thick mat of, of muscle and I add more muscle on top of it, do I have an organ? No, you're right. I need two or more. We need four organs. We need two or more different tissues that work together uh, towards the same function to make our organs. Organs are used to make what? Organ systems. Organ systems. And how many of those do we have in us? Two or more. True, okay, two or more, but more, let's be more specific. In the human body, there we go. We have 11 total yep. organ systems. Excellent, and when you slap all 11 of those organ systems together, you have what? An organism. An organism, absolutely, or an individual. And an individual or an organism, absolutely. Now, can our hierarchy, so again, as someone mentioned, we are going from the smallest to the highest level. But is this really the highest level? Can we continue up beyond individuals? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, right? Individuals can be parts of families or clans, all right, or societies and so and so on and so forth, countries. At that point, we're all in sociology. We're no longer in anatomy and physiology, but technically our hierarchy can continue. However, this is what we are gonna focus on in this class. And here's the key to this. What we want to do, what we are interested in, the fun stuff is right here. This is the fun stuff. What we want to spend our time on is talking about organs and talking about organ systems. But here's the problem. To understand organs and organ systems, we have to understand tissues. And to understand tissues, we need to understand cells. And to understand cells, unfortunately, we have to spend a little time talking about chemistry. Our goal for the first month of this class is going to be to lay the foundation. Talk chemicals, talk cells, talk tissues, get the basic information that isn't just gonna help us to be successful in the rest of 430, but it's gonna be the stuff we need for all of 431. So in fact, the first month of this class is gonna be some of the most important things that we need because you're gonna be using all this information for the next year as you study this material. All right. Now, any book worth its salt, and yours definitely is, is going to have a nice prettier picture than the one that I showed you talking about these things going from, again, uh, where's my, there it is, chemical level to use to make our organelles and cells, the cellular level, tissues, organs, organ systems, and an organism or an individual. So like I said, this is where we want to spend our time but we have to build up to it first. All righty. So, whiteboard. I know I've already covered a lot of material. I'm already tired. I know most of you probably are as well. And so I do feel kind of bad. Because of that, everybody is invited to my house after class tonight for milk and cookies. Mm -hmm. I know that's gonna be more than 10 of us, so we may get a little bit in trouble if that is the case, but I'm willing to risk it. So there you go. 
Oh, wait, hold on. There. Now, we get done at 1235. Based on what I've provided for you here on the board, how many people should I expect by one? 10. 10? You think 10 people can get here? I, I hear, I see a none. Why none? It totally is exactly what my house looks like. You didn't label any landmarks. Ah, exactly. Right. I didn't label. I didn't give you any directional terms. I didn't label any landmarks. I didn't name any of the streets. Exactly. And that's the problem. What you have to remember, and again, this is one of the really this is a challenge for biology, but especially in genetics, especially in anatomy and physiology, learning it is like learning a new language. We are learning a new language, and we want it to be a standardized language. So that when your doctor calls the specialist who lives across the country over in Washington, D.C., and is talking to you about your case, they can communicate with each other in a meaningful fashion. So to do that, we need a standard vocabulary. We need a standard language that is going to allow us to do that. And clearly, this is lacking all of this. All right? So what we need is we need a language, we need a standardization. And it starts just like if I was gonna give you directions to my house, it starts with a general map. You need a map of the world. And in anatomy and physiology, the map of the world is the anatomical position. Anybody know what the anatomical position is? Yes. Palms facing outwards, standing up or laying down. Excellent, somebody wanna demonstrate it for me? Anyone? Oh, okay, Angela, you're close, but you're not standing. So I. <laughs> there you go. Excellent. Perfect. Excellent. You guys absolutely. Like Lori, you did it as well. Perfect. Absolutely. Right. You are standing upright, feet facing forward, even though you can't see my feet. Arms to the side, palms facing forward. That is our anatomical position. And again, you can't get all of me on the screen. But if we cheat and come back here. We can use the pretty picture from your textbook to do this. This is anatomical position. Anytime you talk about the human body, we assume anatomical position. So if this person is curled up in a ball on the floor, if they're chopped up into pieces and spread around the front yard, we always assume anatomical position when we're talking about them. So again, one of the simple things towards that, which hand is this? Right. Yeah, right hand. It's always the patient's hand as you look at them, not yours. So while this side may be right for you, it's their, I mean, left for you, this is their right hand. So we always assume when we're talking about individuals, we use anatomical position. Just like we have that nice big round globe that we call the earth. And once you have that standard map, then things have meaning like north and south, east and west. Things have meaning like Asia and Europe and North America and Canada. Once we have the map here, then we can talk about meaningful terms as well. Now, one of the things I mentioned earlier is one of the things that I love about this class is that this class is hard. And because it's hard, I don't have to be tricky. So you know if we spend an hour and a half talking about some concept in lecture, that's probably a pretty important concept, and it's very likely to be on the exam. All right. However, this is going to be the one exception. This is going to be on the screen for about 30 seconds. However, this could easily be as much as one third of your first lab exam. This information is vitally important. We need to know it, and we need to know it now. Right? These regional terms, the same way you need to know America and Canada and California and Sacramento, we need to know these regional terms, All right? Because if, for instance, I have a big, huge gash in this region of my, le of my leg, what would we call this region of my leg? What is the correct regional term for my upper thigh? Femoral. Femoral, absolutely. There happens to be a large bone in there. It happens to be the largest bone in your body. What bone do you think that is? Femur. The femur. Excellent. There is a large nerve that passes through that region. Guess what nerve that is? 
the moral oh, nerve. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. There's a large artery that passes through that region. Guess what that's called? Femoral artery. Excellent. There's a large muscle group located in that region. Guess what it's called? Femoral. Quad. Actually, the quadricep. Right? <laughs> but it is the quadricep femoris. One of the muscles of it is the rectus femoris. Right? These are terms we're going to use again and again and again and again in this class. And you need to know them yesterday. All right? Now, the same way knowing what Sacramento is and knowing what Roseville is and knowing what Citrus Heights is useful, it's more useful if you know how to get from one to the other. For that, not only do we need to know regional terms, but we need to know directional terms. Now, just like directional terms on the map, north and south go together. These often go together as well. So for instance, our first pair, lateral and medial go together. What does lateral mean? To the side. Farther from the center of the body. There you go, I like that. To the side, but more specifically, away from the midline of the body, excellent. And so medial would be? Closer to the midline of the body. Right, so for instance, if I asked you the relationship between your eyes and your nose, what would the correct answer? Your eyes are what in relation to your nose? Lateral. Excellent, your eyes are lateral to your nose. Or we could switch it around and say your nose is medial to your eyes. Perfect. Is there another term we could have put in here instead of lateral? In describing the relationship of your eyes to your nose? There you go. Excellent. Superior. Your eyes are superior to your nose or your nose is inferior to your eyes. So again, we have these pairs, superior and inferior that work together. Excellent. We have, uh, leave that for now, anterior and posterior. What do these two refer to? Uh, the front and back. Right, absolutely. Which one is which? The posterior is the back and the anterior is the front. Excellent. Anterior is the front. And your posterior, well, quite frankly, is where your posterior is. It is the back. Excellent. However, notice someone else mentioned there are two terms on this list that mean the identical thing to anterior and posterior. What term on here means exactly the exact same thing as anterior? Ventral. There you Caudal. Go. Nope. Well, we'll get to that one, although that one's that one. See, again, fun with vocabulary. No. Anterior as some. Oops, hold on. I'll get to that one. Anterior is identical to ventral. These two terms are completely interchangeable with each other. They both mean the front part of the body. Now, by convention, and that's always a funny phrase, so let me write that down real quick. Anyone know what by convention means? It's okay if you don't. By convention basically is a rule that somebody made up. A bunch of anatomists got together and they made a rule saying that when we talk about the nerves, the back part of the nerve that comes off of our um, spinal cord is going to be called the dorsal root ganglion. And so they use the term dorsal because it's the back one. But is there a term here that means exactly the same thing as back? Dorsal. Posterior, exactly. Posterior and dorsal mean the exact same thing. So would it be wrong to say the posterior root ganglion? No. This would be perfectly acceptable to say. It's just by rule, one gets used more than another. So they tend to say dorsal root ganglion. They tend to say anterior root, right? So again, the, the they are completely interchangeable terms. Notice in between them are two terms that are similar, 
but not identical. And that's the other important thing to learn about anatomists. Anatomists hate you, right? And they will show it to you many, many ways. They'll make rules and they'll break them all the time. They'll give 14 names to the exact same thing. Anatomists are horrible, horrible people. And this is a perfect example. Cephalic and caudal are similar to anterior and posterior, but they're not the same. Cephalic is actually towards the head. Still all right. <clears throat> Whereas caudal means towards the tail. Now, again, if you think of someone standing upright, head is up, tail is down. So it sounds like those would be similar terms. But it also, especially when we talk about nervous tissue, when we're talking about the brain, towards the front of the brain is considered cephalic and towards the back of the brain is considered caudal. So they're not identical terms. They're, they're kind of means up and down, uh, uh, towards the head, towards the, bot, the tail, up and down, but also forward and back. It also is used developmentally when we look like little fish and still have tails. So again, they are similar terms, but they are not identical. All right. So we're starting to get this north, south, east, and west stuff down. And like I said, we always assume the body is in anatomical position. But is the body always in anatomical position? No. no. What position would you be in if you were prone? On your stomach. Yeah, there you go. Lying down on your stomach. That'd be face down. I like it. Like if you're getting ready to do a push-up. Whereas what position you would you be in if you were supine? On your back. Excellent. This would be on face up, just for consistency. But you're right. On your back, like you were getting ready to do a, a sit-up or a crunch or something along those lines. All right. Here are two fun, fun words. When we, let's cheat, hold on, I'll move that there. I have all these windows I have to play with, hold on, there we go. Let's use two more examples. Uh, knee and ankle. What is the relationship of the knee to the ankle? What term could we put in here? Knee uh, is superior. Is so the knee is distal mm -hmm. to the ankle? Yes. It's actually the other way around, proximal. The knee is proximal to the ankle. Proximal means closer to the core of the body. Uh, the body, whereas distal means uh, further from the core of the body. So we could do it the other way around. We could say that the ankle is distal. Let me move this down here. We could say the ankle is distal to the knee, but the knee is proximal to the ankle. All right? Or let's take another example. Uh, let me cheat. Get rid of that one. I like this one better. Uh, the. Um, oh, hold on. wrist in relation to the elbow. So how could we describe the relationship of the wrist to the elbow? Excellent. One thing we could say is we could say that it is distal. Is there another term we could put in here? Lateral. Excellent. We could say lateral. Why not, uh, why not inferior? Anyone know? Wouldn't inferior work here? No. No, it turns out it wouldn't. It feels like it should, but when we talk about superior and inferior, really we talk about just the core of the body. So when we are talking about the appendages, we have to use terms like proximal and distal. 
right? So in our arms and legs, we have to use proximal and distal. We cannot use a superior and inferior. All right. Now, let's take one more example. Let's say. Can you go over the definition of lateral again, please? Hold on a second. Okay. Uh, shoulder. Elbow and wrist. So if you think of an anatomical position, right, an anatomical position, my arm is to the side. So notice my wrist is more lateral, further away from the core of my body than the elbow is. So it's further from the core of the body and, and the elbow is closer to the midline. So this would be proximal, the wrist would be distal. It's further from the core of the body. So we said the wrist was distal. Distal, excellent. And based on our definitions, what would our shoulder be? Proximal. Proximal. So what does that make our elbow? Elbow is uh, uh, prox uh, distal, proximal to the... Uh... You've absolutely got the right idea. We could say that the elbow is distal to the shoulder, but proximal to the wrist. But that would be a big, huge alphabet soup mouth word of things to say. If only there was one term we could use, and Ariel's figure oh, yes. intermediate. Intermediate means between. Notice not medial. Medial means towards the midline. Intermediate means between. So our shoulder is proximal, our wrist is distal, and our elbow is intermediate. All right, questions on that? Got another one for you. Heart and ribs. What is our heart in relation to our ribs? Deep. There you go, excellent. Excellent, it is deep. If your heart is not deep to your ribs, please see a doctor immediately. All right. Now, we could also say our heart is deep, we have our ribs, and then we have our skin. What would we say the skin was in this case? Superficial. Excellent. Superficial. Superficial. And what would that make the ribs? If the heart's deep, and the skin superficial, what does that make our ribs? Perhaps it's only... If only there was a term we could use for in between. Intermediate, intermediate. Intermediate. There you go. Perfect. Intermediate. There you go. Notice most of these words aren't that unfamiliar. Most people are familiar with at least some of these words. Where things get a teeny bit tricky are these two right here. These are terms that most people aren't as familiar with. Contralateral and ipsilateral. Anyone know what ipsilateral means? On the same no. side. Same side. Excellent, right? If you think about it, if I touch something hot with my hand, right? A pain signal comes into my spinal cord to tell me that I felt something painful and a signal goes back out to my arm to pull my arm away before I'm even aware of the fact that I should be cursing. <laughs> Notice all of that happened on the left side of my body. That was an ipsilateral reflex. However, if I decide I want to wave my left hand at you, where do I originally make that decision? Right side of the brain. Right side of the brain. Notice in this case, it starts over here, has to cross the midline to go and tell my left hand what to do. And when you cross the midline, that information goes contralateral. So contralateral is when you cross the midline, ipsilateral is when you stay on the same side of the midline. All right. I know this is a lot of information I've thrown at you pretty fast, but there is a nice table in your textbook that does a good job of talking about this. All right, questions on that? All right, <clears throat> excellent. Now, 
this is all great. And, and, and again, this is actually a great way to study this, especially I saw a couple of you have kids. The kids can be incredibly annoying, right? They're horrible, horrible things. I have two of them myself. Uh, but occasionally they can be useful for studying. And uh, one of the ways you can do that is you can get a paintbrush and you can wet that paintbrush and you can paint on their body. And what you can do is you can give driving directions. Right, so if you wanted, for instance, driving directions to take your paintbrush uh, from the right elbow over to the left shoulder, you can combine regional terms and directional terms, right? You start in the right anticubital region, you go proximally to the brachial region, proximally to the axillary region, medially to the thoracic region, and so on and so forth, you can give these driving directions uh, with that paintbrush on the surface using your directional terms, using your regional terms and put them together. And those types of questions also make good essay questions on occasion. But, and this one I don't suggest you do with your kids, do not, uh, it is occasionally useful to cut a body, body up into two pieces to study it as well. Mm -hmm. And when we cut a body into two pieces, what is one of the ways we can cut the body into two pieces? I make one slice in the body and I have two pieces. How could I describe those two pieces? What's one mm -hmm. of the ways I can cut the body and get two pieces? Actually, a right and a left. Perfect. A right and a left. Excellent. And you guys have hit that on the head. The type of section of the body that divides the body into a left piece and a right piece is what we call a sagittal mm -hmm. section. Oops. Oops, did I spell it right? Perfect. Sagittal section. How many sagittal sections can I make of the body? Four. One? Four. Four? More? A lot, absolutely. Yeah. Think of it this way. If I cut off my right thumb, do I have a right piece and a left piece? Yeah, they're not equal in size, but do I have a right piece and a left piece? Absolutely, there you go, a couple people got it. They're an infinite, an infinite number. Uh, that's not right. An infinite number of sections that can be made, right? However, of those infinite possible numbers that can be made, how many perfectly divide the body into two equal and opposite halves? One. Just one. So there is one special section that divides the body into two equal and opposite halves, and we give that special section a special name. We call it a mid-sagittal section, or it is also called a median section. And there's only one of those. So all the rest are off of that midpoint and all the rest, therefore, are then called parasagittal. So you have an infinite number of parasagittal sections and one special median or mid-sagittal section. Excellent. What's another way we can divide the body? Instead of right and left, what else can we do? Top, Top and bottom. bottom. Of course. We are, now, oops, we are now in an anatomy and physiology class, so we might want to use correct anatomical terms instead of top and bottom. So what would we say instead of top and bottom? Um, top part would be called a... Inferior and superior. There you go. Superior and inferior uh, sections. And someone's already hit it on the head. The type of section that gives us a top and a bottom piece is what we call a transverse section, or what is also known as a cross section. Guess how many transverse sections of the body we can make? A lot, again, 
infinite number of sections. Is there a special one where we get two equal and opposite pop parts? Does the top of you look like the bottom of you turned upside down? No. So again, there's no special section for a transverse section, just that transverse or cross section. What else is left? Right, left, top, bottom, front and back. Excellent. Front and back. There you go. And as someone already mentioned, we don't want to use front and back. We want to use anterior and posterior. But let's, again, front and back. But as was mentioned, correct anatomical terms, anterior and posterior. Is there anything else we could have used instead of anterior and posterior? Frontal plane. No. Anterior and posterior or... Superior, oh. inferior, and dorsal. Ventral oh. and dorsal. Excellent. Perfect. Remember, anterior and ventral mean the same thing exactly. Posterior and dorsal mean the same thing exactly. All right. Excellent. What do we call the type of section that cuts us into a front piece and a back piece? Frontal plane. True, absolutely. So one of the things is it's called a frontal plane. Or what is also the other one, which again has become much more famous these days, coronal section. There you go, right? Because again, if you think about it, if you were cutting in half, it'd be like a crown on my head and everybody now knows crown, a coronal means crown. We have a coronal section. How many coronal sections can we make? Two. Into the numbers, right? If we cut off the tip of my nose, do I have a front piece and a back piece? Yeah, absolutely. Again, they don't have to be even. So again, an infinite number. And does the front of you look like the back of you? Is there a special cut that divides us into equal and opposite front and back pieces? No. So again, no special sections for that as well. The only one that has a special section is the sagittal section. So there you go. These three sections are what are called the cardinal planes of section. And the reason they're called the cardinal planes of section is they're all 90 degree angles from each other. Here I write it out in the pretty words, but I think often this makes more sense if we look at the pretty pictures. Here we see those 90 degree angles. We see that frontal or coronal plane, front and back piece, top and bottom, transverse, left and right, sagittal. Now, someone already spoiled the surprise, but I like that. Um, are we required when we're chopping up a body into pieces to always have to do it at perfect right angles like this? Is it possible to just half off a chunk at an angle? No. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So this obviously wouldn't be frontal, transverse, or sagittal. Neither would that, and neither would this, and neither would this one here. So is there a good general term we can use for a section of the body that isn't at a perfect right angle, isn't one of these cardinal planes of section? I know someone said it already, but say it for me again. What do we call a cut of the body that is at an angle like this? There you go, an oblique section, perfect. An oblique section is the fourth way we can cut the body. And basically that's at any angle that is not 90 degrees from the others. So we have our three cardinal planes of section. <coughs> Excuse me. And then everything else falls into an oblique section. All right. Questions on that? All right. Excellent. All right. We, uh, now that we have cut the body up, the reason we want to cut the body up is because like those Easter egg bunnies, we're hollow on the inside. We have all these spaces and we need to talk about what's in those spaces and divide up those spaces and talk about what protects those spaces. 
here things are going to get start to get a little dense. We're going to start to get a little vocabulary dense. Again, this is like learning a new language. So I think this is another good stopping point. So let's go ahead and take our next break right here. Uh, we'll just take, uh, we still have a lot to cover. So we're just going to take a 10 minute break. I'll come back at 1035. And at 1035, we will restart the lecture at this point. If anybody has any questions or anything that they haven't had answered yet, this would be a perfect opportunity to ask those questions. So let's go ahead and take a quick 10 minute break, come back at 1035 and we will start the lecture then. All right, any questions? Is it possible that you can go a few slides? Yes. I'm sorry, what? Um, can you please go a few slides back? Uh, sure. Although I'll remind you, all these slides are on, so this one? Not the next one. That? Um, yeah. Okay. I will remind you that all these slides are available for you on Canvas. So if you look in the module, you do have all these. So don't feel you have to be writing all these things down. If you print them out ahead of time or you save them as a PDF, you can then, you know, like on an iPad or something like that, mark them up and write on them. So again, remember, you do have access to these things ahead of time. All right. Oh, okay. Any other questions? My question is about the um, the workbook again. Yes. The workbook again. Mm -hmm. So um, I have the textbook bundle. Yes. And you're saying I need to get, like, is there a way that I could get the... Um, so one good question came up uh, as we were starting the break. And so, again, I was worried some people might have already left and I didn't want to miss it. Uh, but uh, I was about Labster again, and, and so I wanted to make sure to show this to make sure that you guys understand this part, because I think this is another one of those areas where people sometimes get a little confused. Notice over here on the uh, sideboard, there is a Labster dashboard, but this Labster dashboard just shows you uh, what you've what activities you've completed and what your scores on them are. Notice mine's blank right now because I haven't done any of the activities yet. To actually get to the activities, you don't use the dashboard, you go to the modules. And under the modules, this is where you will see all the Labster activities. So you'll click here to go to the Labster activity. There. And then it gives the description of it and the link to load the Labster and do it that way. So you get to it through the modules. And again, as I also mentioned, the modules is also where you're going to find the lecture handouts. So when you look at the lecture handouts, <clears throat> notice you have the handouts of all the pictures of all the things that we've been talking about. So you don't have to necessarily scribble on all of the orientation directional terms because they're here in the handouts. So you have that stuff for you there as well. All right. So, any other questions before we dive back in? Okay, so our goal now is to talk about the hollow spaces on the inside of the body, our body cavities. Now, the body is divided primarily into two main spaces. There it is. The first is the dorsal body cavity. Of course, is there another name we could have given it instead of dorsal body cavity? Posterior. Like, yeah, posterior. So again, either of those terms would be fine here. The posterior body cavity, the dorsal body cavity is dorsal, it's to the back. And this is a general cavity. It is a general term. This one general cavity can be divided into two specific cavities. And any idea what those two specific cavities might be? Brassic and uh, pelvic. Close, that would be the ventral ones. For the dorsal, the ones on the back, it would be, there you go, it'd be cranial cavity and vertebral. So cranial would be, and let's, Grab this, move that up there so that we can emphasize this specific cavity. Cranial cavity. What, what do you think forms the cranial cavity? Brain. Brain. Well, what forms the cranial cavity? 
All right, yeah, the bones of the well, skull. There the you bones. Go. Excellent, the bones of the skull. However, what it contains, you guys are absolutely correct, is it contains the brain. Excellent. We also have a vertebral or spinal cavity, which again is a specific cavity. <clears throat> what forms the vertebral cavity? The vertebras. All right, the vertebral, the vertebral bones. And what does it contain? Spinal cord. Or, yeah, primarily the spinal cord. Excellent. Perfect. Excellent. There you go. So notice we have these general cavity, the dorsal body cavity, and then two specific cavities. And we see this on the pretty picture as well. Here we see the pretty picture. Now, one of the things that I will often say many times you'll get tired of hearing this is that, uh, like I said, I like this class because it's hard because I don't have to be tricky, but I am going to be specific. I am going to be precise. I will be very precise in my wording of the questions, and I expect you to be equally precise in your answering of them. One of the things I will say again and again and again in this class is that people lose points, not because they don't know the information, but because they don't read the questions carefully. You have to read the questions carefully to answer them, I mean, read the questions carefully so that you can answer them correctly. Here's where people get into trouble. On an exam, I could have a picture exactly like this, and I could have a nice big fat arrow, I know that's not a big fat arrow, but it's an arrow anyway, pointing to that space. And the problem is I can ask two different questions. I could ask you the question to identify the general space. And if I were to ask that, what would the answer be? Cranial cavity. The cranial cavity and vertebral cavity. Which, which one? The cranial. Nope. Dorsal. Identify the general cavity. The general space. Dorsal. Dorsal cavity. There you go. Dorsal body cavity. Notice I could have that exact same picture with that exact same arrow, and I could ask you to identify the specific space. And is the answer to that the same, or is the answer to that different? Cranial. Right. Is it the same or is it different? Different. 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 Absolutely. It would, this one would be the cranial cavity. All right. Oops. What happened there? Put it in the right pocket. Wrong part. Cranial. Notice exact same picture, exact same arrow, but two different questions. You have to read the question correctly so you can answer it correctly. Read it carefully so you can answer it correctly. All right. I will be very specific in how I ask the question. Notice the first question I asked was general space and a lot of you said cranial. Clearly you were showing me you have knowledge and understand these concepts. But here's the problem. Did you answer the question that I asked? No. And if you don't ask the answer the question, can I give you full credit for it? No. No. So again, my goal is not to be tricky, but the problem is we can often have an arrow like this and there's a bunch of questions I can ask. Notice I could add a third question, identify the structure you would find in this space. Brain. Brain, there you go, exactly, right? If I ask that on the exam, I could ask, Identify oops, the structure found in this space. And you on the test, I uh, look at this and you get all excited. Oh, I know what that is. And maybe in your answer, you write down, uh, this is the cranial cavity, which is part of the dorsal body cavity. And you're excited and you move on. And you've given me a tremendous amount of information, more information than I asked for. But you didn't answer the question. And if you don't answer the question, I can't give you full credit for it. 
So read the questions carefully so you can answer them correctly. I'll be very precise in my wording. You need to be equally precise in your answers. All right? That's the easy one. Let's get to the fun one. The fun one is the ventral body cavity. And remind me again, is there another word we could use instead of ventral? Uh, you'd probably get partial credit. Depends on the question. I can't say it would, it would depend on the question as to whether you'd get full or partial credit. Uh, pardon me, partial or no credit for something like that. What's the other word for ventral? Anterior, excellent. Oh, anterior. And again, remember this is a, a general cavity, general term. This ventral body cavity, uh, I think I actually say it here. Let's see it there. Oh, actually I died. Whoops. Well, here we go. This general body cavity here in red is divided anatomically into two, oops. intermediate cavities. So that's a powerful statement right there. So let's break it down. What do I mean by divided anatomically? Divided by a structure. There you go, absolutely. There is actually a physical structure that divides it, that divides the space, excellent. Anyone know what that structure might be? The diaphragm. Diaphragm, excellent. The diaphragm, absolutely. Here on the pretty picture, I'll use my highlighter, uh, use purple. Here we see that diaphragm, it is an anatomical structure that physically divides the uh, ventral body cavity into to intermediate spaces. And that's the other key to this. Intermediate spaces are intermediate cavities, which tells you what? Is this as small as it gets? What did intermediate mean again? In between. In between. So do you think there's going to be even smaller cavities inside of these intermediate cavities? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Excellent. So let's talk about the two intermediate cavities at first. One of them is the thoracic cavity. And I'm going to cheat and move this down here. The other is the... Oh, well, I guess I'm going to burrow. There we go. So much nicer when I have a uh, whiteboard to write on that doesn't have to sneak these things into the lecture. Excellent. So again, the ventral body cavity is divided anatomically into two intermediate cavities, the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity. So this is a general cavity. These two we would consider intermediate cavities. <clears throat> And they're divided anatomically. There is a physical structure that separates them. So your lungs should not be down in your belly. Your small intestine should not be up here in your chest. There is a physical barrier that keeps those things separate. All right. Now, here in the, uh, we talked about how the brain and the spinal cord are in the dorsal body cavity. Here in the ventral body cavity, we have all sorts of gushy squishy organs that are known as our visceral organs or our viscera. And again, fun with vocabulary, viscera is the noun. If instead I said visceral organs, visceral is the adjective that describes the noun that is the organs. So again, fun with vocabulary there. Either way you describe them are the same. Things like the heart and the lungs and the stomach and all sorts of things like that. Now, these things need to be protected. So there are gonna be membranes that protect the head, 
I mean, the, the, the brain and the spinal cord, the heart and the lungs and the stomach and all those types of things. But as I also mentioned, these are intermediate cavities, meaning that can be further broken down. And the thoracic cavity can be divided into three distinct regions. Let's take a look at that. Here, we see, what plane of section would this be? What view would this be? Anterior. anterior. It is an anterior view, absolutely. What plane of section would give us this anterior view? Frontal. Yeah, frontal or coronal section, excellent. Notice when we do that, and I'll use, I think blue might show pretty good, that this thoracic cavity, while it looks like four, kind of is four, but there are three main divisions. The first over here is the space for the right lung, and that is the right pleural cavity. Over here is the left pleural cavity. And the space in between is the mediastinum. This mediastinum also happens to contain the space that contains the heart as well. Now this picture has gotten a little confusing, so let's change our view. Here's a better view. What plane of section is this? Transverse. Transverse section, excellent. Is it a superior or an inferior view? Inferior. Type your answers this time, because I want to see, uh, I want to count. Is this a superior view or an inferior view? Write what you think your answer is. Superior, superior, superior. Everybody says superior. Oh, there's one inferior. All right, let's figure it out. Let's orient ourselves on this, right? First, easy, we know it's a transverse section. This individual, the way it's oriented right now, would they be in a prone or a supine position? Oh, inferior is making a comeback. Is this person prone or supine? You can say these out loud now. Excellent, supine. Right, meaning they're laying on their back facing upward. Excellent. So now we have two choices. This is a person that's laying down. As you're looking at this, they could be laying down with their head coming through the screen at you, or they could be laying down facing up with their feet coming out towards you and their head behind the screen. Which one is this? Are their feet here in, the, um, in, in your room or are your feet behind the computer? Well, notice the right lung. If this is the right lung, could I lay down this way and that be my right lung? Or do I have to turn around and tilt my head through the screen and have my feet here in the classroom? Feet here in the classroom for this to be the right lung. That means I've cut this person in half and tilted them back, and I am looking at this from the underside. So this is indeed an inferior view. This is a person I've cut in half and tilted back. Now I pushed them back and we're looking at them from the underside. So this is an inferior view. One of the things you've got to get used to is get used to looking at the body from different points of view. All right? So be able to orient yourself with the body. Not only is this going to be important for histology, but it's important for the gross anatomy as well. All right. Now we know what we're looking at. We can get a better sense of these spaces that I was talking about. Notice over here, this space located over here is our right pleural cavity. And notice it is separate from the space over here that is the left pleural cavity. All right? Notice they don't connect to each other. You may not have thought of it in those terms, but I know you're aware of it because Friday night's right around the corner. And as you do every Friday night, you go to the bar, have a couple too many two Long Island iced teas. And as you're sitting there, you get into a big, huge argument about who the cutest Jonas brother is. 
which is silly because everybody knows it's Nick, right? <laughs> but these things clearly can become very heated and knives could come out and suddenly you have a knife wound in your side, blood and air gets in there and one of your lungs collapses. And are you gonna die because of that? No. No, because luckily each lung is individually shrink wrapped, right? And so they have their own cavities, their own spaces around them. What's located here in yellow in between is our third region. And that third region is the mediastinum. So this whole third region right here is what is known as the mediastinum. And notice our mediastinum can further be divided because inside of our mediastinum is a cavity that contains the heart. And this cavity that contains the heart is the pericardial cavity. So our thoracic cavity is divided up into three spaces right pleural cavity, left pleural cavity, mediastinum. And then our mediastinum has an additional space inside of it as well. Uh, yes, if air can get trapped into the space of a pleural cavity or fluid, and if that occurs, the pressure in there drops and the lung actually collapses, right? So again, if that example of that knife wound that you have in the ribs, what they will do is they will take a tube Oh, that's not a tube. There you go. Stick a tube in there and try to suck out the fluid, suck out the air, reproduce a negative uh, pressure inside that cavity and help the lung to reinflate. All right. We saw that prettily here. Here we see a nice flow chart that does a good job of showing this as well. So those further subdivisions of the thoracic cavity which again, remember, we, are, we use that term an intermediate cavity to distinguish it from all of these, which we would call specific cavities. So notice our thoracic is part of the ventral, which is our general cavity, thoracic intermediate, right plural would be specific. So notice again, on the exam, if we cheat and go back, on the exam, if I have an arrow on a test pointing at this space, notice there are three questions I could ask. Identify the general space, and what would your answer be? Yeah, let's make it bigger. Identify the general space. <coughs> I'll wait. Ventral body cavity. Ventral body cavity. Excellent. Identify the intermediate space. Thoracic. Thoracic. Identify the specific space. Right, right plural. Cavity. Right plural cavity. Excellent. 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 All right. See how it works. It's all very simple and straightforward. Excellent. Notice we also mentioned the abdominal pelvic cavity is also an intermediate cavity divided up into two specific cavities. So again, this is intermediate. And these are specific. But here's the problem. Abdominal cavity and pelvic cavity don't have precise anatomical borders. The thoracic cavity divided up into those three regions, and there are membranes that help to define that. There's not the same way in the abdominal pelvic cavity. So, well, the pelvic cavity is primarily contained within the bowl of your pelvis, the bones. It doesn't have a top on it. There isn't an anatomical feature that divides it. So abdominal cavity and pelvic cavity isn't really a very useful way of distinguishing those. So what we can do with the abdominal pelvic cavity is instead, instead talk about it in two different ways. One way is we can identify it by its quadrants. To divide the abdominal pelvic cavity into quadrants, we draw a vertical line through the belly button and a horizontal line through the belly button. When we do that, we get four quadrants with very technical names. 
upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right. And we can divide it this way. For instance, the liver is primarily found in which quadrant or quadrants? Right upper. Right upper, yeah. It may sneak a little bit over onto the left upper, but it's primarily in the right upper. What quadrant or quadrants would you find the bladder in? Lower quadrant. Which one? Lower left. More left. More left implies that some of it's in the right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so both. Absolutely, right? If you think about it, the bladder kind of sits right here in the midpoint. So it would be in both the right and the left quadrant. Which quadrant would the right lung be in? I don't None of them. Right. There you go. Now that was the trick question. Notice it's better for me to ask the quest trick questions here than on the actual exam. Remember, these are abdominal pelvic um, quadrants. The diaphragm remembers that roof, the anatomical barrier from the thoracic. The lung is up here. It's not in the abdominal pelvic cavity. So the roof of the abdominal pelvic cavity is the diaphragm. Anything above the diaphragm is not in one of these quadrants. All right? Quadrants are useful, uh, but we can do better. If instead of playing with the belly button, maybe instead we want to play tic-tac-toe. We want to play tic-tac-toe, right? We get nine regions. And those nine regions names are a little bit trickier than uh, what we had before. They are the right and left hypochondriac, right and left lumbar, right and left inguinal, and then if you're getting tic-tac-toe down the middle, epigastric, umbilical, and hypogastric, or pubic region. Now, often in this class, we will get these alphabet soup terms that you can be guaranteed you're gonna have to spell at some point. But often they tell you everything about them. What does hypo mean? Below. Below. What Hello. does chondriac refer to? Andrea, I mean costa, ribs. Yeah, exactly. It means to the cartilage in the, of the costal ribs. Absolutely. So hypochondriac literally means below the ribs. All right. Now, we commonly think of the term hypochondriac as someone who pretends to be ill, but often if you pretend to be ill, you pretend to have some kind of stomach ache, which is below the ribs. Epigastric. What does epi refer to? Above. Yeah, above. Yeah, above or on top of. Gastric refers to? Stomach. Stomach. Above the stomach. All right. So again, not only do you need to be able to identify the regions, but you need to know what organs would be found in. So again, if I ask the question, identify the quadrant or quadrants you would find the liver in, what would the answer to that question be? Right hypochondriac region. That it? Right, 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 upper quadrant. There you go. Well, for starters, yes, I said quadrants and not regions. But right. if you think about it, you're, <laughs> so again, purposely trying to be tricky. The liver is your largest visceral organ. It probably sits like this. So what often happens on the exam is I ask you for the quadrant or quadrants that you would find the liver in. And someone rattles off to me, you would find the liver in the apigastric region, the umbilical region, the right lumbar region, and the right hypochondriac region, which shows great knowledge, is the harder <sighs> question to answer, but didn't answer the question I asked. Again, people often lose points, not because they don't know the information, but because they don't read the questions carefully. Now notice here, I got a pretty picture that kind of puts them all together showing you. Notice, as I said, the liver does sneak over into the right upper quadrant, right? Now, notice, and this is a great example, does every single person's gallbladder sneak down here into the umbilical region? Is not, not typically. going to be in the umbilical region? Not typically. No, of course not. Some people's are going to be there, but some's, oops, no, wrong button. 
For some, it could be there. For some, it'll be a little higher. For some, it may be over here more lateral, right? So again, if I asked you to identify two organs that were in the epigastric region and you put the gallbladder, I would accept that. But is gallbladder ever going to be the right answer for the left lumbar region? No. No, exactly. So again, there's going to be some gush and mush in here with people. Uh, but um, again, so minor movements of things are going to be fine. But nobody's gallbladder is going to be over here on the left side of the body. So it's got to, you know, I'll give you some leeway on those types of questions uh, within region, reason. So, right. sir, as you, as you said, like uh, for the liver, so the right answer for the liver will be upper right qu uh, quadrant? No, the correct answer would be upper right and upper left. Upper right and left? Yep. Upper right and upper left. There is your liver. Notice here are your quadrants. Mm -hmm. What quadrants do you find the liver in? Upper right, so upper for, right. for for large for large intestine we we have the what 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 will be the, the answer for the large intestine like it is like in lower lower uh, uh, right and left quadrant and maybe a portion in the upper and the uh, also right and left quadrants so what will be the right answer for the large intestine you could argue, depending on how it's found in the body, it could, it, it is conceivable that the large intestine could, now again, notice this person's large intestine is really low, but if, it, but if the large intestine was a little higher or the stomach was a little smaller, it is theoretically possible that the large intestine could potentially be in all of the regions. What? It is possible conceivable that it, you could argue that it is possible for the large intestine to potentially be in all of the regions. Yeah. And it's definitely in all four quadrants. That one's easy. Yeah. But you could, you, could, you could argue that it's potentially possible to be in all nine regions. All right. Thank you. Yep. No problem. All right, excellent. So now we've started to talk about the spaces where we found the organs and even some of the organs themselves. But as we talked about, these organs need to be protected. So there are going to be tissues that wrap around them and protect them. For the dorsal body cavity, and again, remember this is the brain and the spinal cord. Um, these have a very special protective membrane around them called the meninges. These meninges are actually comprised of three different tissue layers that come together to wrap around and protect the brain and spinal cord. We will learn all the anatomy of them in much more depth and detail when we get to the nervous system, but that's going to be way at the end of the class. So for right now, you just need to know that things in the dorsal body cavity are protected by meninges. What we're going to be more interested in on this test is what protects the ventral body cavity organs, the heart, the lungs, the stomach, the spleen, things along those lines. And those things are what we call serous membranes. Again, serous is the adjective that describes the membrane. So if you wanted to use the noun, you could also say serosa. That would be acceptable as well. One of the things that is special about serous membranes is they have double layers. And so, of course, we need a way to tell these layers apart. And that way to tell the layers apart are the parietal and visceral layers. Now, the analogy that your book uses that I like a lot is to use the example of a balloon that is partially filled with air. And then what you do is you take your fist, told you I was an amazing artist, and you shove that fist into the balloon. 
What happens when you do that, when you shove that fist into the balloon, and oh, hey, I can cheat. I don't have to redraw it. I can move my balloon out of the way. Oh, don't know what you thought there. All right, get rid of that. Think, think. If you think about what happens with a partially filled balloon, a filled balloon, you'd probably pop it. But with a partially filled balloon, what's going to happen is some of the balloon is going to squeeze along tight along the surface of your hand. But because there is air in it, the whole balloon doesn't collapse around your hand because there is a little bit of air inside this space. This is exactly what our serious membranes do. Again, as I just finished mentioning, I am an amazing artist. So as you can see, I can draw, nope, wrong color. An incredibly accurate representation of what the heart looks like in your body. There it is right there. And the exact same thing happens with the heart. There is a layer of membrane that wraps around, okay, let's pretend that it's actually in contact with, the, uh, the surface of the heart, and then it forms a pocket or a space around it. Now let's go back to our balloon. In this balloon, is there any difference between this little piece of balloon and this little piece of balloon right here? If I were to cut those two pieces of balloon out, and put them under the microscope and look at them, would they look any different? No. No, exactly. Again, it's an obvious question. No, the layers are identical in anatomy. What is different about them is their location. And that's really the key. One of the main things we are gonna learn in anatomy and physiology is we like anatomists, because they hate you, like to give things names based on their locations. All right. This is a mouse. Is this the only mouse in the existence of humankind? No. No, there are gajillions of them. However, this is the one that happens to be located in my house. And more importantly, it's the one located in my room, right? Uh, I, there are three others identical to this in my house because my daughters both have computers and they both have mouths. And we bought them at Costco. So we got like 47, all of them for $3. So we all have mice and they're all identical to each other. The only difference is this is the one in my room. And because this is the one is in my room, it is mine. We're giving it a name based on its location. And that's exactly what we do here. A tissue, well, oh, don't want that big arrow now, that is in direct contact with the organ. When it's in direct contact with the organ, we call it visceral. When instead it's forming the cavity, we call it parietal. So here we have the parietal, forms the cavity, forms or lines the cavity. Visceral lines the organ. So notice we have the exact same thing over here on the heart. This serous membrane that lines the surface of the heart, how would we identify it? There you go, visceral. And this membrane that forms the space, forms the cavity, how would we identify it? Parietal. Parietal, excellent. Perfect. Well, almost perfect. There are a couple more things we need to talk about. Notice then this would be our cavity. Whoops, wrong button. the same way this over here was our cavity. This cavity over here of the balloon is filled with air. 
Is this cavity over here with the heart filled with air as well? No. No. What is it filled with? Fluid. Well, close. You guys are right. It has a serious fluid in there, but is it really filled with serious fluid? No. No, right? We don't want it filled, but you guys have the yeah. right idea. It's going to be lined with a serious fluid. Why? What does that serious fluid do? Keep lubrication. The heart. Right. Lubrication between the layers. Protection. Lubrication. Reduces friction. Excellent. All those things. So there's going to be a thin line of serious fluid lining the inner surface of this cavity. All right. Excellent. So far, so good. Except for one more thing. There are not only parietal and visceral serous membranes, there are three main types of serous membranes based on the organs they surround. Here, we have a visceral and parietal serous membrane that wraps around the heart. Guess what we call the serous membrane that surrounds the heart? Pericardial. There you go. So this one here would be the visceral pericardium. Pericardium. Or pericardial membrane, that would be fine as well. Again, noun versus adjective is fine. And this would be the parietal pericardium. And this would be the pericardial cavity. There you go. Fun with vocabulary. Questions on this? All right, again, I've done an amazing job of drawing this, but let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. Notice here, we have a fist in that air-filled balloon, and we have that Visceral pericardium aligning the surface of the organ. Parietal pericardium forming the cavity. And notice the two connect. The two membranes always connect. And then in between, we have that pericardial cavity. We haven't thought about it in these terms, but we've actually already seen this once. When we were talking about the thoracic cavity, for instance, Inside the mediastinum, we saw the pericardial cavity. Well, the lungs have serous membranes wrapped around them as well. What do you think we call the serous membrane that wraps around the lungs? Pleura. Right. It is the pleura that forms the pleural cavities. Pleura. Right. Our mediastinum has the pericardium. Notice the mediastinum itself. Where is my annotation? There it is. The mediastinum cavity itself has no serous membrane on it, but it does contain the pericardium. <clears throat> so there's no serous membrane in actually the mediastinum itself, but it does contain the pericardium. Oh, see, now that I've written that, I'll erase it. Notice now, when we look back at this view, we can see those things we've talked about. This over here, oh, well, that's too thick. Undo. This right here would be the right parietal pleura. This right here would be the right visceral pleura. Parietal pericardium, visceral pericardium, visceral left pleura, parietal left pleura. And then of course we have the cavities in between lined with that serous fluid. And anyone know what we call the serous membrane in the abdominal pelvic cavity that wraps around things like the liver and the stomach, the spleen? Peritoneum. There you go, excellent, peritoneum. So it is the peritoneum. So there you go. 
if you think about it, we have, it's known as this three serous membranes, but if you think about it, we really have six. Oops. Because for each of these three, the pleura, the pericardium, well, heck, actually we really have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have the right visceral, the left visceral for the pleuras. Uh, pleura, we have the right parietal pleura. We have the left parietal pleura. We have the uh, visceral pericardium. We have the parietal pericardium. We have the visceral peritoneum and the parietal peritoneum. Excellent. So if you think about it, and let's cheat now. So I'll do that, and I'll do that, and I'll erase that so I can grab this and bring it over there. So if you think about it, we really have eight specific serous membranes lining our ventral body cavity. All right. Questions on that. And notice, if you pulled any single one of these eight off and looked at it under the microscope, it would look like all the other ones. So again, if you notice, all of these names are, oh, oops, wrong button. Okay. There. Oh, I know what's happening. Uh, all right, checks. Problem is I drew my picture after I drew this, so it won't go in front of it anymore. You guys get the idea though, uh, hopefully. But um, can't arrange these things, it's so frustrating. All right, whatever. So those are the eight ones. And again, notice they're all based on location. That's the real key that I wanted to say. These are all named based on their location. All right, that's the key. We've given these names. They're all serous membranes, but we're giving them names based on their locations. All right. Questions on that? Perfect. Oops. All right. So we've talked about where the organs are located, but the other important thing we need to talk about is where the water is located. Right. Us here in Sacramento probably understand and appreciate this more than most. Because if you upset the balance in water of your body, let's say, oh, for instance, trying to drink a massive amount of water to win what is now a completely outdated video game system. By upsetting the balance of water in your body, can that lead to problems? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So paying attention to where your body, the water is in your body is vitally important. In fact, if you look at it, 60% of your body weight is water. So knowing where your water is and how it moves through your body is vitally important. Notice a large amount of that is actually inside of the cells or what we call the intracellular fluid. And the rest, about 20%, a two to one ratio, is the extracellular found in places like blood plasma and lymph and things like that, and also between the cells in the interstitial fluid. Right. And that relationship of the water in your blood versus the interstitial fluid versus in your cell is a very important balance we're going to maintain and talk about maintaining the balance of so that, right, if you try to we for a we, you don't upset that balance uh, leading to cell death, leading to organ failure, leading ultimately to death in that individual trying to win a video game system. All right, so we'll talk a lot about the movement of water as well as the organs and stuff inside. 
And that is that. All right, excellent. Um, the last little bit we need to talk about uh, is to switch gears into the lab mode. As I mentioned, we we're going to talk about the organs and organ systems. And looking at the clock, we actually have time for one more quick break. So let's take one more quick 10 minute break. I will, so come back again at 1135. And at 1135, we will restart the lecture. Or really, really what we'll do is we'll start the lab and talk about our organs and organ systems. I see there's a couple of chat things. Uh, go back. Some of the slides aren't on the PDF. All right, I can go back. Should be on there, but uh, you're right. Uh, I do post these ahead of time because I want you guys to have them at the beginning of the section, but I will admit I am a tinkerer. I do tend to tinker with the slides, so there may be some minor differences in them. Uh, missing slides or slides moved. I think that may be what happened with this one. I think the slides are near the end, but, uh, but again, I tinker with things. So um, again, another reason to make sure you come to lecture and uh, don't just rely on the slides. All right, any other questions? So like I said, let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, and so again, we will restart at 11.35. I'll see you in 10 minutes. Set our goal now. Uh, any questions before we get started? All right, excellent. Our goal now will be then to um, go through our 11 organ systems, identify the organ systems, talk about the basic functions of them, and some of the organs involved. Again, we need to have a good general overview of the body. We don't have to have everything mastered at this point. Again, then there'd be no point in anatomy and physiology, uh, but, uh, well, again, this is lab stuff, so I haven't really, it really isn't on there, and, and most of you guys are gonna be writing it for me anyway, so I don't really have that. Um, but we're gonna write this out. This is the last little bit we have to do for today, so we're gonna do this here on the board. Um, 11 organ systems, identify the functions, basic functions, and basic organs involved. And again, by basic organs, what I mean is, uh, for instance, for uh, you need to know what the large intestine is at this point. You should be able to identify the large intestine. When we get to uh, the digestive system in 431, you'll learn about how that large intestine is made up of the cecum and the ascending colon and the hepatic flexure and the transverse colon and the splenic flexure and the descending colon and the sigmoid colon and the rectum and all the parts of that. You don't necessarily need to know that for now, uh, but uh, yes, I can. Um, but I do want some of the basic information, so let's do that. So again, our goal is to go through all 11 organ systems. For each one, we're gonna talk about one or two general functions and we're gonna identify one or two organs for each of them. So let's do that. Identify for me one of the 11 organ systems of the body. Cardiovascular or respiratory. Excellent, okay, I like that one, cardiovascular. All right, I heard that one. Uh, let's see, someone's chatted one. Uh, integumentary, excellent, I like that. Ooh, and reproductive. Endocrine. Excellent. Wait, wait, going a little too fast. Integumentary, reproductive. Endocrine. Uh, endocrine. Skeletal. Skeletal. Nervous. Nervous. Digestive. Digestive. I saw muscular. Respiratory. respiratory. Hold on, hold on. Respiratory. Urinary system. Muscular. Lymphatic. Lymphatic, two, three, four. Circulatory. Uh, circulatory would fall under cardiovascular. Uh, digestive, that's the one we're missing. And one more, right? What one haven't we hit? Urinary. Urinary, there you go. Urinary, yeah. Perfect, excellent. So excellent, those are Me. our 11 organ systems. Let's go through each one. For each one, uh, let's identify a uh, basic function. Let's identify one or two organs associated with them. What would you say the basic function of the cardiovascular system would be? Heart. Heart. 
pumping blood. Okay, well, again, you guys are providing me with the right information, but remember, pay attention to the question. What is the function of the cardiovascular system? Pump blood. It's a pump. Okay, excellent. Transport, it pumps. transport cells. There you go. Well, transportation, excellent. The cardiovascular system is a system that is, well, it helps if I spell it right. There you go. Is a system that is specialized for transportation, right? You guys talked about pumping that blood. What is it transport? Blood, blood and nutrients. Nu nutrients. Excellent. So nutrients. What else? Waste. Waste. All right. What else? Give me at least one. Cells. More. I'm saying. Say again. Cells. One more time. Cells, C-E-L-L-S. Oh, oh, sure. oh, cells, yeah, absolutely. So like white blood cells for defenses, things like that. Oxygen, CO2, gases, etc. Right, there's a whole bunch of stuff that it transports, absolutely. Its job is to get all of these things to all the cells of our body, help to maintain them, remove waste, all of those types of things. And of course, some of the organs involved, you guys already mentioned the heart. Are there any others? Lungs. Uh, I would say the, the lungs are certainly related. Respir to respiratory, yeah. I think, yeah they would Blood vessels. Blood, Blood vessels. vessels. And can we divide those into different flavors? Artery and vascular, I mean heart and okay. Arteries and what else? Veins. Veins and? And uh, capillaries. Capillaries, there you go. Perfect, excellent. All right. What about the integumentary system? What would you say its function is? Protection. Or, uh, protection. Protection, absolutely. Provide that barrier between us and the outside world. What's the major organ of the integumentary system? Skin. Skin, absolutely, right? It is our skin. Our skin is our integumentary. Our integumentary is our skin. Absolutely. Our skin is our largest organ. Remember, we talked about in our hierarchy how things are made up of different layers of tissues to make an organ. The integumentary system is our largest organ. Essentially, it's made up of two types of tissues, an epithelial tissue and connective tissues. Uh, so it's one of the simplest organs, but also one of our largest organs. Excellent. Uh, what is the function of the reproductive system? Reproduction. Yeah, building is tall because it is tall. Right, so well, let's be more specific. So, again, oops, hold on. Again, you guys want to be careful about uh, your phone calls and other things when uh, when the uh, when your mic is on. So, again, you wouldn't say the building is tall because it is tall. So, let's say something else. What does it mean to reproduce? What is the function of the reproductive system? Entertainment. Create offspring. There you go. I like that. Create offspring. Oops. Uh, oops, there you go, try that again. Excellent. Our goal is to create offspring, to produce other people, basically, right? Absolutely. Excellent. Well, propagating the species, I think, more than DNA replication. All of our cells have to replicate DNA if we're going to be able to divide and create them. What are the primary organs of the reproductive system? Ovaries. There you go. Excellent. Anything else? Uterus, testes. Scrotum. This is what I was looking for. There you go. Well, first, okay, this is an anatomy and physiology class, so you guys are allowed to say penis and vagina, all right? Now, those aren't the right answers, but you are allowed to say them. But you guys have hit on the right ones. The correct ones are indeed the primary organs. Again, obviously, the penis and the vagina are organs in the reproductive system. But I would argue that the primary organs are indeed the ovaries and the testes. And do we have a generic term we could use for both of those? Genitals? Genitals is a good one. I like genitals. Genitals work. I was thinking more <laughs> gonads. Gonads was more what I was thinking of, but genitals kind of works as well. Yeah, the ovaries and the testes. They're the ones, as we explained to my daughter when she asked when she was four, that make the puzzle pieces that mommy and daddy put together to make her, right? So those are the puzzle pieces that you put together, the eggs and the sperm produced by the uh, ovaries and the testes. And obviously the vagina and the penis are copulatory organs, they're required as well. But like I said, I would say the, the ovaries and the testes are the primary ones. 
What's the function of the endocrine system? Manufacture hormones? Okay, absolutely. Regulate hormones? Right, it does indeed make hormones, but what is it that those hormones do? It pretty much turns things on and off and kickstarts different things in the body metabolically and otherwise. And theoretically, how many things in the body could be infected, could be affected by those hormones? Everything. Everything. Everything, right? Everything you said is absolutely 100% correct. Absolutely. If only there was a single word that would sum up what you guys described, right? Is there a single word that might sum up what you describe of being able to right, send a signal to basically every potential cell in the body and have some effect on it? Maybe I may have written it on the board. Communication. Maybe I just wrote it on the board. It begins with communication. There you go. Excellent. Communication. Perfect. Excellent. Absolutely. Our endocrine system is a system that is specialized for communication. Specifically by making those hormones, making a chemical signal, and spreading that chemical signal through the body. And it has the potential, as we talked about, to potentially affect every single cell in the body. Is there another organ system on this list that is also specialized for communication? Nervous system. Yeah. Nervous system. The nervous system is also specialized for communication. All right. However, does it do it by making hormones, by making a chemical signal? No. How does our nervous system communicate? Impulses. Right. Electrical signals, big fancy electrical signals. Any electrical signals, I'll write that. Anybody know the name for those big fancy electrical signals? Action potential. Neurons. Perfect. Yeah, sure. Now the neurons are the cells that do them, but the actual name for that big positive electrical signal is an action potential. So notice both the endocrine system and the nervous system are specialized for communication, but they communicate in very different ways. Endocrine system makes a chemical signal, nervous system basically produces an electrical signal. And what's the big difference between these two systems that are specialized for communication? Hormonal system is controlled by the nervous system. The two are related, yes. Route of communication? I'm sorry? Route of communication? Definitely route would be part of it, the organs involved. All of those things are true, but there's an even a simpler, right? Think of it this way. When I put my hand on something hot, do the cells there produce a chemical signal that they can release into the blood so that it can go through the circuit? The brain. So it eventually gets to my brain to tell my brain that I'm in pain so that my brain can produce a chemical signal that can be released from the cell and circulate into the blood till it finally gets to my arm and I pull my arm away from that hot flame. Is that what happens? Yeah. Chemical versus electrical. Is that what happens? Do I, do, I produce chemical, do I use hormones to tell me to move my arm? No. no. Receptors. It's brain, it's messages. Katie's got it. Uh, it's speed. The biggest difference between the endocrine and the nervous system is the speed. If I had to wait to produce hormones to my brain and then my brain to produce hormones to send it to my hand to tell me that I was in pain, my hand would be burned off before that process was completed. Nervous system is incredibly fast, right? It's like an electron moving on your wire. When you flip the light switch on your room, the light goes on instantaneously. When you touch that thing hot, that electrical signal goes to your spinal cord and back to your hand to move your hand before you're even aware of the fact that you should be cursing. It is an incredibly fast process. The endocrine is a much slower form of communication, but it's still very, very powerful. So it allows us to do more longer lasting things, right? How many of you are the exact same size right now that you were when you were born? Hopefully for your moms, not too many of you, right? So you went from small people to big people. You went from girls to women or boys to men, right? Those kind of big, large uh, growth, development, maturation, 
all of those big complicated processes require coordination, require communication, and that's what our endocrine system does. Our endocrine system provides us with a slower, longer lasting chemical signal, but it can be just as powerful within its uh, communication. All right. Give me an organ in the endocrine system. Adrenal gland. Adrenal gland. There you go. That's an excellent one. Thyroid. Thyroid gland. Those ovaries and testes we just talked about. Not only are they part of the reproductive system, they're part of the endocrine system because not only do they produce puzzle pieces, what else do they produce? Tertiary glands. Hormones. Hormones, right? Estrogens and androgens. Right, like we talked about, those are the ones that turn the girl people into women people and the boy people into men people. Right. Growth stimulating hormones or pituitary glands. Yeah, pituitary glands, another great one. Excellent. Give me an organ in the nervous system. Spinal cord. Spinal cord, excellent. Give me another one. Brain. Brain, nerves. excellent. Give me one more. Nerves. Neurons. Nerves, there you go. Nerves, I like that. Perfect, excellent. Nerves, brain, spinal cord, all sorts of fun things like that. All right, questions on those two. All right, we skipped one. Let's go back. Skeletal system. What's the function of the skeletal system? Framework. Oh, I like that. I like that word. Framework. Absolutely, right? It provides structure. It provides support. Back in ancient times, and by ancient times, of course, I mean the 80s. <laughs> uh, during those ancient times, uh, there was a cartoonist uh, by the name of Gary Larson. And he did these uh, esoteric cartoons known as the Far Side. And by far, my favorite Far Side is this one right here. <laughs> is representation of a boneless chicken ranch. Notice these chickens without their bones have no structure, have no support, right? They can't be upright. It doesn't have that vertical axis. Absolutely. They, they do not have that support because it gives that framework. And that framework is vitally important. Right? I like that you guys said framework first, because something that else that people talk about is that, and it does indeed do, is our skeletal system does provide some protection. But at the same time, how many bones do I have in my hand? Uh, a lot. A lot, exactly. There are a lot. And are any of them providing any protection? No. No. They're providing support and structure, and they provide one more thing. What's the other thing that they provide? Movement. Yeah, levers for the movement, absolutely. So, skeletal system must be a organ system, so that means it must have organs. What are the organs of the skeletal system? Bones. Bones, and how many do you have? 206. Nope. You have far, far more than 206. In fact, everybody in this class probably has closer to 300, if not more, bones in your body. However, as Adina has pointed out, you have 206 named bones in your body. They are named because all of, them kind of, all of us kind of have them in the same location. As we will learn when we get to the skeletal system, we have tons of other bones that are in different locations throughout everybody's body. And since we all have them in different places, we can't give them names. But we have many, many bones, far more than 206. But you guys are absolutely correct in that there are 206 that have names. Excellent. Questions on that? All right. What is the function of the respiratory system? Exchange of gases. Exchange of gases. I like that. Gases, plural, all right? And what gases would those be? Oxygen, CO2. carbon dioxide. There you go, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Too often people forget about, well, where did it happen, where to go? Uh, I don't know where that went, so let's do it this way. O2 and CO2. Too often people forget about carbon dioxide, but as we'll learn, more when we get to 431 and we talk about the respiratory system. In many ways, CO2 is actually more important to your body than oxygen, all right? When you don't get your way, what do you do? 
with the intro? Hold your breath, right? I don't want to go to school. <gasps> right? And your wife says, tough, you have to teach today, get out of here. Right? You hold your breath. Can you hold your breath forever? No. No, eventually you have to breathe because you run out of oxygen. You can't expel CO2. Yeah. You actually, what typically causes you to breathe isn't the fact that you run out of oxygen. What happens is you build up too much CO2 in your body and your body has to force it out. So uh, CO2 is just as important, if not more important uh, than oxygen. They're equally important, at least, in that exchange that takes place. Excellent. So that's with that. Uh, what are some of the organs in the respiratory system? Lungs. Lungs. What else? Heart. Heart yeah. Lungs, oops, yeah. there we go. Lungs, what else? Trachea. Trachea. Pharynx. Pharynx, give me another one. Nose, I like nose. Nose. Mouth? No. No? Nasal cavity. What about the mouth? Mouth, uh, Yes. Uh, oral pharynx. I've heard, I've heard it both ways now. I've heard someone say yes and someone say no. Is the mouth a part of the respiratory system? Yes. No. Yes. yes. Excellent. All right. Let's switch the question around. If I were to take a straw and stick it up my nose and I were to be able to inhale that way, could I actually get milk into my stomach through my nose? Yes. 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 Does that mean that your nose is part of the digestive system? Yes. No. No. No, of course not. And it's the same thing with the mouth and the respiratory system. Yes, anybody who's ever had a cold, right, survived because they were able to pull air through their mouth into their lungs. But just because air passes through it doesn't mean that it is part of that system. The respiratory system is about taking that air, right, this beautiful California air that we have in front of us, right, and getting it into your lungs for gas exchange. And especially now outside with all of that smoke, do you just want to take a big clump of that air and stick it straight into the lungs? No, we want to filter it. We need to clean it. We need to process it. And the nose is specialized for that, whereas our mouth is not. So yeah, air can get through the mouth, but the mouth is not an organ in the respiratory system any more than your nose, even though you can get milk through your nose into the uh, into your stomach, the nose is not part of the digestive system, and the mouth is not part of the respiratory system. What's the function of the muscular system? Produce movement. Excellent. Produce movement. Move our body through space. Excellent. Again, it's an organ system, so it must have organs. How many organs are there? Or what are the organs of the muscular system? Muscles. 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 Excellent. How many of those do you have? We have, 200, we have 206 named bones, and I will tell you right now, you are going to learn all of them. How many named muscles do you have? More than 300. Yeah, actually more than 600. You have about 600 named muscles in the body. Are you going to have to learn all of them? No. No, the good news is you will not have to learn all of them. Only about 520. All right? I'm just kidding. All right, excellent. What's the function of the lymphatic system? Lymphatic system it is... include the, um, the red bone arrow? Say again? Lymphatic. You're right. It does, it does involve the red bone marrow. It's definitely a part of the lymphatic system. Lymphatic system is part of the blood system. So it, did, uh, it, it it's, uh, it's like it's also transport. It has also transportation. Uh, uh, as the blood has transportation nutrients, the lymphatic system transportation. The main job is transportation. You are correct. It's, it's defensive against infection and diseases, right? You are all absolutely correct. So yes. Now, the only thing that I would say that it, to be careful about is the lymphatic is not a part of the cardiovascular system. The two systems are indeed related to each other, but you have the right idea. It is also a system that is specialized for transportation. Remember, we talked about the cardiovascular system is moving all these things around our body. And it turns out our cardiovascular system, especially those capillaries, are a little bit leaky. 
So a little bit of fluid and stuff come out. So the job of the lymphatic system is to take that excess fluid and stuff and bring it back and deposit it into the cardiovascular system. And as you guys mentioned, does it do it blindly? It just scoops it up and dumps it back into the heart without looking at it? No, its job is to process it and filter it and look for harmful or abnormal cells or other pathogens. So it plays an important role in our immune response. I'm sitting in my chair right now and my left leg is asleep, so I can't get up on my soapbox right now. But if I could, I would tell you right now, you do not have an immune system. Systems are made up of organs that put together. You do not have an immune system. We have 11 organ systems and they are listed here. What you have is an immune response, which is a cellular and chemical response to harmful pathogens or abnormal things that are found in your body. And they are an important function of your lymphatic system. All right. Give me some of the organs of your lymphatic system. Lymph nodes. Lymph nodes, the lymph. Bone marrow. Bone marrow. Yeah, we heard bone marrow already. Excellent. Spleen, tonsils, right? All of these are good examples of stuff. Excellent. This is a function of our digestive system, and we know not to say to digest. Store. Store food. Breakdown of. Um, I like breakdown better. Absorb Excellent. nutrients. Break down food and absorb nutrients. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I like that a lot. There you go. One of the interesting things about the digestive system is most of the functions of the digestive system actually occur outside of the body. All right. Think of it this way. Uh, I have something small. Ah. Paper clip. All right, here, let's cheat. Be big. All right, paper clip. If I were to take this paper clip and I were to put it in my mouth, is it inside my body when I do that? All right, I'll ask an easier question. I take a paper clip, I put it in my hand, and I wrap my hand around it. Is that paper clip inside my body? No. 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 So if I hold it in my mouth, is it inside my body? No. No. If I close my mouth on it, I'm not gonna do that, but if I were to close my mouth on it, would it be inside my body? No. 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 Same way I close my fingers around it and it wasn't in my body, it's not in my body. If you wanna get into my body, you have to pass through a membrane. Right, so if I take this and jabbed it into my arm, it would pass through a membrane and it would go through. If I swallowed this paper clip, has it passed a membrane? No. 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 It doesn't answer, no. Again, hopefully nobody is ever swallowing paper clips, but there are plenty of little kids that swallow pennies. When you swallow a penny, it enters your digestive system and your digestive system is basically a hollow tube that goes all the way from mouth to anus, all right? So that penny enters into a little scent sign. I don't make a scent sign anymore. Do that. That penny enters into the digestive system. And when it enters into the digestive system, what happens to it? It goes out. My, my three-year-old swallows a penny and what happens? It's there. It's there. Eventually Stores. it comes out the other end. Yeah, there you go. Eventually it comes out the other end. A little dirtier or a little cleaner, depending on how you think of it. But absolutely, it passes right on through the digestive system and comes out the other end and it never actually enters the body. Right? To enter the body, you have to pass the membrane, right? That's the difference between swallowing a penny and swallowing that cheeseburger you had for breakfast. When you swallowed that cheeseburger that you had for breakfast, all right, there's the cheeseburger. On it. Please uh, silence your mic when your phone goes off. 
we swallow that cheeseburger you have for breakfast, that cheeseburger is then broken down. And that as it is broken down, there we go. As it is broken down, the nutrients from that cross the membrane and then enter into our body. So the lumen of the digestive system of the digestive system is actually considered to be outside the body. They have a fancy name for this. We call it the topological. Oops, so I spell it correctly. Exterior. So that penny passes on through. Your body has no need of currency. It has no penny receptors. So it passes right on through, whereas that cheeseburger gets broken down, is absorbed across the membrane, and enters into your body. And of course, what are some of the organs of the digestive system? Stomach. Mouth. 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 There you Esophagus. go. Esophagus. Esophagus, excellent, right? Rectum. Intestine, small intestine, excellent. That whole gallbladder. Tongue, gallbladder, perfect, excellent. All of those are great ones. Excellent, excellent. All right, that leaves us one. Our urinary system, probably the worst named of all of the organ systems. What is the function of the urinary system? Is it to produce great waste? There you go. And more specifically, from where? The kidney. Oh. The kidney is what does the job, but where does it actually take the waste out of? Out of the bladder? No, not from the bladder. Where does it actually remove the waste from? Bloodstream? Hold on, someone's chatting. Let me see if they got it. The nephrons? Blood. There the you blood. go. It removes waste from the blood. How important is that function? Very important. Super important, absolutely. All right, let's think of it this way. We talked about the respiratory system and the lungs. If you lost or damaged one of your lungs, would you survive? Yes. Yeah. So you could live with one lung, right? Would you be able to be a professional athlete with just one lung? No. Probably not. One eyeball, could you survive? Yes. Yeah. Would you be a very good wide receiver probably with just one eyeball? <laughs> no. No, probably not. But what about one kidney? No. Could you survive with just one kidney? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Could you be a professional athlete with just no. one kidney? No. Yes. Yeah. One kidney, right? One of the things we'll learn in this class and talk about a lot is life is lazy, right? The job of a living organism isn't to be the most efficient possible thing it can. It's to find something that works and use that as many times as possible. There aren't a lot of redundancies. But one of the places we have them is our kidneys. You could lose a kidney, you could sell it on eBay, right? Get it stolen from you in a bar in Taiwan, whatever happens, you could survive with just one kidney. And in fact, function completely normal. You could be a professional athlete. One kidney is capable of doing all the cleaning of the blood that is necessary for you. Now, if you're a professional athlete, you might not want to continue to be a professional athlete if you only had one kidney. Because if you injured that second kidney, what happens then? If you have no functioning kidney. Need a transplant. Yeah, and, and yeah, exactly. Your, your prognosis is not very good if you have zero kidneys, right? Yes, dialysis is a short-term gap, but is it a long-term solution? No. No, you have to have that transplant. Filtering the blood, filtering waste from the blood is a vitally important process, right? So it isn't the making of the urine that's important. It's the filtering of the blood. Of course, when we filter that blood, where does all that waste go? Urine. Into the urine, absolutely, right? And you are constantly making urine. You're constantly filtering the blood. While you sit here in this class, during the course of a day, over a 24-hour period of time, you filter 200 liters of fluid out of your blood. All right, for starters, do you have 200 liters of extra fluid in your blood? No. no, absolutely not. You produce 200 liters of urine in a day? No. No. no, if you did, we'd be giving this lecture in the bathroom. We'd all be sitting in the bathroom. <laughs> the bathroom. No, absolutely not. No. So we only produce about one to two liters of urine because about 99% of that, of that oh. filtrate that comes out is processed and reabsorbed. You observe. Yeah, and it's constantly happening. You are actually urinating as we speak. 
because urination means to make urine, right? That doesn't mean dribbling it out of your body. Hopefully that's not happening for you right now. But you are filtering the blood, making that urine, and then that urine is going to the bladder where we store it so you can get to a socially appropriate location and you can void it at that point. And someone already mentioned it, but of course, the rock star organ of the urinary system where all this goes down is where? Kidney. Kidney, absolutely, right? The rest of the urinary organs, the ureters, the bladder, the urethra, like I said, is really just about voiding that urine, uh, you know, storing it until you get to a socially appropriate location and then release it. So the, right. main, the primary organs of the uh, urinary tract system is uh, only kidneys? Well, I mean, again, when we talk about all the organs, it's kidneys, it's the ureter, it's the bladder, it's the urethra. Those are the four main organs, uh, really five because you have two ureters or I guess seven because you have two kidneys. But when you think of the functions, the kidneys do all the work. All the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra do is move and store the urine. There is not any processing of that fluid that takes place in those organs. So it's just storing it till you get to a socially appropriate location and then voiding it. The kidneys do all the work. All righty. There you go. Just that simply, we have identified the 11 organ systems, their functions, basic functions. We haven't hit all the functions of all of them. We haven't hit all the organs of all of them, but it's a good starting point. All right, your book's got a nice table that goes through all of these as well. Any questions on any of this? All righty. So again, it's that figure in your textbook. That is everything, how are we on time? Perfect, we're doing a little good, finishing a little early today. That won't always be the case. Good news is that is everything that I wanted to cover for today. As I mentioned, a fair number of you have not completed all of the activities. They're gonna be due also starting today at the end of class until uh, Wednesday morning, you have your chemistry quiz. Chemistry quiz is 20 points. It does use the proctorio testing method. So I encourage you to take your proctorio test first so that you can work out any kinks or any problems and make sure it works properly that way before you do it with the chemistry quiz and run into some problems that way. So make sure you do your proctorio quiz first. Again, I know it's stupid, but you have to fill out that lab safety form. There's a student info sheet where you can give me information. Oh, uh, speaking of that proctorio quiz, that's the other thing I wanted to show you. Okay, that reminds me, excellent. Um, another, uh, error is not the right word. The other thing that I think sometimes students miss. Where do I want to go? I wanna go here. When you are on your home page, when I grade things, and again, I haven't seen it for this one here, but when I um, grade things, there's often a blue dot next to your grades. Notice also over here, you'll see feedback. For some of you, when doing your proctorial compatibility and syllabus quiz, your scanning was not quite appropriate. So I've made some notices of that. I've made some, given you some feedback on those. If you ask me questions on the student info sheet, I've answered some of those. Others I'll save till I get all the student info sheets and we'll talk about those on Wednesday. Uh, but you wanna make sure that you're seeing that feedback from me, especially if you were, didn't do your scanning correctly because you wanna make sure you do it properly before you take a test that actually counts, that actually matters. Because you can lose 10% for uh, not doing it properly. So make sure you do that properly. Check for those notifications and the recent feedback. And also when you go to the grades, and then you go to an activity. When you click on that activity, you can actually see the comments there. So you can see the comments. And again, I wrote this for me, so it's just a test. But you can see this here in your grades as well. So make sure you're paying attention and finding those comments so that you can appreciate if there's, if you've either asked me a question, that's where I'm gonna answer it on a test, or uh, if there was some problem with the test, that is where I'll put that information to make sure that you uh, correct it. Uh, some of you, uh, when you're doing your uh, lab waivers are submitting blank lab waivers because if you fill out the form and you don't print it as a PDF or save it as a PDF, 
then if you just try to submit it, it'll be blank. So for those, you should have gotten a grade of zero and a notice from me warning you about that. And this, you just have to resubmit it uh, for full credit. So it's not, I'm not penalizing you. I just, I, again, for whatever reason, I have to have those on file. So check those things as well. All right. Questions on any of that? Sir, I have a question on factorial, as I said in the beginning of the class. Yep. I have the problem, like I don't see it. So here's, so here's, what, here's what I will suggest. Um, we're going to finish up now. I'll answer all the rest of the questions that we have. And then what I'm going to do is I will close this uh, class because I'm recording it. I will stop recording it. And then the uh, video has to compile. That usually takes an hour or two for it to, to do that so that I can compile it and submit it to uh, YouTube. And it takes a while for it to do that. So I will switch to my office uh, Zoom site, my Zoom room, and then you can come to there. We'll work that out. And then also anybody who still has to do their five for five can come and do that as well. So we'll uh, give me a five minute break, 10 minute break to, to go grab something real quick and then uh, something to drink. Uh, and then, um, well, I'll meet you in my Zoom office and we can do that. If you cannot make my office hours, then email me and uh, we'll try to make other arrangements either today or tomorrow to do that, to make sure you get your points before Wednesday. Um, make sure you fill out all your forms and stuff. Make sure you take your chemistry quiz. Uh, I was gonna say something else. I'm gonna remember what it was now. Oh, if you're one of the students that are adding, make sure you eat that I gave, that I said was adding, make sure you contact me so that I can get you that ad slip so you can do it today, tomorrow at the latest. Again, if you do not add it tomorrow, you're not going to be on my roster on Wednesday, and you will be dropped. All right? Yeah, Questions okay. on any of that? So we're waiting. I'm sorry? I'm waiting, uh, like, for after the break. To so see no. your office hours. Don't, don't stay here. I'm closing this room. Okay. okay. Go, to my, go to my office room. Okay. Sir. All right. Any other questions? I had one question. Yes. Um... Uh, what part of the book did you say that we should read for the chemistry quiz? So in the chemistry chapter, uh, the kind of the basic stuff is the, the, the first part of the chapter. And then when it starts getting into the macromolecules, like when it's talking about proteins and carbohydrates and lipids, those are the things we're going to talk about in class. So basically everything up to the macromolecules is a reminder of some of it. Now, again, is it everything you covered in your chemistry course? No, but if you don't have other resources, it's a good starting point to give you most of the basic stuff you would need. Okay, thank you. But like I also said, I warn you uh, two things. I didn't write these questions, so they didn't come from me, so this is not how I write questions. Uh, I got this from a chemistry instructor. And so again, and because it's not directly from your textbook, like I said, the textbook might not cover everything, but it would, should hopefully be enough of a reminder to help you to be successful on most of the questions. Okay. All right. Awesome questions. I appreciate how interactive you guys were. It makes the class so much better uh, when it's interactive and I'm not just here talking to myself. So I want to thank you guys for that. I appreciate it greatly. All right. Any other questions? All right. Excellent. I'm going to shut this down. I, I will switch over to my office. We'll start at uh, 225. So that way we can take a quick seven minute break. I can go get into something to drink. Uh, again, the first week I always tend to try to start to lose my voice, so I got to be careful. Um, just so much yammering. Uh, so, thank you guys so much, and I will see you bright and early Wednesday morning. Thank you. All right, bye. bye. Thank you.